Today, we're going to talk about brain fit. I appreciate everybody being here. I wanted to, to let you know as we start today that uh, my wife and I have specialty degrees and certifications in neurology, and for 20 years, we have abounded information and research on the brain, keeping the brain healthy, reversing brain pathologies, and so there is no way to talk about everything that's needed to be talked about today. Can everybody get that? Um, there's just not. We actually took more slides out than we actually have in the presentation today. And there's quite a few. And there's going to be a lot of good stuff. But our goal for you today is that you leave, number one, encouraged. Everybody say encouraged. Encouraged. Encourage. Your perspective changed. You get the resources that you need. If you're a guest, we'll make sure every single guest gets a, che a chance to get your spine checked, uh, schedule an appointment, start your journey of health, reverse a lot of things that you might have. And then for every single person, when you leave today, leave with action steps that actually really do something. Does this make sense? I, the last thing we want to do is spend, you know, 300 plus hours putting on a, a, a presentation or an event like this for someone to have a good experience. Does this make sense? Like a jacuzzi. Like we had a good time together but didn't create anything. After 20 years of doing this, it's the last thing I want to do. Like I only want to do stuff that's going to change people's lives now, which means you have to take something out of here and take action on it. Does that make sense? Got it? So let's just get started. I'm going to get into what this is and what it means. This is about building a better brain, okay? So it's not just about dementia. It's not just about Alzheimer's. When we start talking about the brain and, and what's, quote, normal, what's not normal, you'll start to hear words like cognitive, which means mental or brain, decline, which means your brain just starts what? Not working as well, not working as well, okay? Now, related with that and brain in general, dysfunctions can be uh, labeled as a lot of things, ADHD, depression, anxiety, uh, a lot of different diagnoses or symptoms you can have. Is everybody with me? Right? So no matter if you've got any of those things, and it's not just dementia, it's not just Alzheimer's, just keep listening because everything that we're talking about applies to you if it's about getting your brain better. Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get an amen? amen? Good. I pastored for like three and a half years, so it kind of means a lot for my amen corner. All right, so this is our agenda. Make sure you're ready for that. Let's just start with something that's really important for you to understand. Right now, you really don't have any idea how amazing your brain actually is. In fact, let me just start with just some rote facts and just some fun facts. Like if, if you could think about just blood vessels, right? Now think about the smallest tube that you could personally think about that you could get water through. Can you think about that? So in your mind, now just imagine how thick it is in your hand. Can you do that? So imagine how many blood vessels or how many feet of blood vessels you have just in your, in your head, right? So like hundreds of feet, right, or, or, or a thousand feet, something like this. Now just do that. Take that size in your mind, that blood vessel, run it out the door to your car. Now run it from your car all the way to Louisville, like where, like where Walmart is. And, then, and now you can imagine one mile of that tube and how long that is, a mile of that. Is everybody with me? Mentally, you get that picture? Now watch this. Now I want you to spool it up. I want you to put it on a spool. I want you to get it as tight as you can. And how much does one mile of the smallest little tube that you can imagine, how much space does that occupy? Quite a bit, right? I mean, it probably wouldn't fit in your car. You'd have to have like a big pickup truck or a trailer. Make sense? Now imagine this. Your brain doesn't have a mile of blood vessels. It has 400 miles of blood vessels just inside your cranium. Did you hear what I just said? Like, like in your mind, when I heard that, I was like, I don't see how you could have anything but blood vessels inside of your head. Is everybody with me on that? So that's amazing by itself. But now watch this. It gets even more amazing. Your brain tissue is surrounded by those blood vessels. And the reason that that brain tissue has so many blood vessels is because your brain is a big piece of electrical fat. Everybody with me? Everybody say fat head. Now, you thought that that was a, a, a derogatory statement. From now on, if someone calls you a fat, you'd be like, yeah, absolutely. But it's, it's basically electrolyzed, it's uh, electrical fat, okay? But that electrical fat keeps a charge on it. We'll talk about how that works later today. And keeping an electrical charge, it needs oxygen, it needs glucose. So it needs these things to run this. Does that make sense? And that's why it needs all that blood supply. But let me give you an idea of how amazing... Just the tissue, not the blood vessel, just the tissue of the brain is. Just if you could take a, a, something the size of a grain of sand, so it would just fit on your shirt, you wouldn't even see it, right? So take a, take a piece of your brain tissue, just the size of a grain of sand, 
how many neurons do you think, brain cells, how many brain cells do you think are inside that grain of sand worth of brain tissue? Any guess? Come on. 350, 2,000, 10,000. Actually, there's 100,000 cells in a grain of sand worth of your brain. Now watch this. Where they overlap and they interconnect, how many interconnections or what we call synapses, how many synapses do you think are within the grain of sand worth of your brain? Six. <laughs> a little more than six. Watch this. A million? Watch this. 500 million? Watch this. There's over one billion synaptic connections in a grain of sand worth of your brain. In fact, they did a, they did a uh, thalamic uh, model, a computer model of your brain um, to see exactly what the synaptic connections and movements were. And this was this is just over a billion synapses. Now, this is the entire brain mapped out with over a billion synaptic connections. Now, that's not one grain of sand. That's a whole brain. So imagine this thing with a billion per grain of sand, what it would look like. The further you get down into the research, what you start to find is it, it goes past what science can really put its finger on. Actually, every scientist at some point in time, when they really start, if they're really good scientists and they really get further and further and further down the rabbit hole, they eventually get to a point where they actually put their finger on and go, wow, all I can see is the fingerprint of the divine. If you went back 25, 30 years ago, if you ask a scientist if they believed in God, they would say, well, of course I don't believe in God, I'm a scientist. And now what's happening is, after the genome project, after what we see with the neurology, you get to this point where now, literally, People that are the greatest scientists of today say, of course I believe in God because I'm a scientist. Does that make sense? So let's start with one thing in mind first. We're dealing with something that is infinitely past what we can understand. It's like asking a four-year-old to explain complex geometry or physics. Does that make sense? It's just, it's way beyond us. So we're not saying that we know everything. We're saying that we start with a premise, number one, that the body is fearfully and wonderfully made and we know certain things about it and we stay with that. And when you start with the premise of your body is self-healing and we know uh, the certain things that we do know that help it function better and we stay towards that, then that's how you help the body heal and support it rather than detract from it. Is everybody with me? Got it? So that's what we're starting with. So let's just, just start with um, some of the terms, like dementia. Let's just start, what, what is dementia? It's basically an umbrella term for a lot of things going on with your brain, right? So memory impairment, uh, problem solving, all the rest. Does everybody get me? So it's just an umbrella term. In fact, Alzheimer's is basically just dementia. It's just the most, um, the most heard about, the most recognized form of dementia. Everybody with me? Okay. I'm also going to talk about Alzheimer's later on as it pertains to genetics. Raise your hand if you've heard that there is a genetic link to Alzheimer's. Raise your hand if you've heard that. If you've heard it, come on. Nobody else? Raise your hand. Come on. I want to see it. Hi. I want to see that. Good. So most of the room. Okay. Would it surprise you that only 3% of all the millions of people with Alzheimer's, only 3% of Alzheimer's diagnoses actually even have the gene for Alzheimer's? Did you know that? So do you think it's genetic? And I'm going to go back to that. But Alzheimer's and dementia, there's lots of different kinds. There's vascular dementias, uh, which deal with blood supply and inflammation, toxicity, Lewy body, which is also like nutritional efficiencies, frontotemporal dementias, and we could go on to Huntington's and Kreutzfeldt Jacob, which is more like mad cow. Uh, but frontotemporal, temporal, basically the frontal lobe, everybody go like this, go like this. Your frontal lobe is the, one of the most common areas of your brain to be damaged, okay? And not necessarily from like an impact or trauma, but damage from nutritional deficiencies, deficiencies of any kind, oh, and toxicities. It's the first thing that's damaged a lot, which is very related to, watch this, leaky gut. Everybody say leaky gut. So when you start talking about gut dysfunction, we'll talk about that later today, we're leading into lots of different dimensions, uh, but also Alzheimer's, but especially frontotemporal. Um, it's on the rise, would you agree, right? And the problem with that is the younger people are now taking care of their families. Guess what one of the number one growing businesses is in the United States right now? Senior homes. We have a, a patient who's just spectacular. He's an investment uh, guy. He, he invests in this. And they're actually, he's got like four or five being built right now. And he says the, the, the reason that they're so effective, he says that they're actually going in a, like a campus and they're stair-stepped. So you go in and you can kind of take care of yourself. And then as it progresses and it gets worse, then there's somebody that can take care of you more. And as all you get along the, the campus, to, towards the end of the campus, it's where people are just stuck in bed and they can't talk and they can't do anything for themselves. And this is what 
This is what is the, one of the number one growing businesses. And one of the second number one growing businesses is actually memory daycare facilities. Does anybody know what that is? That's where people are being taken because their younger children or younger, they're not retired yet, are taking care of a parent who's no longer safe to be by themselves. And I, wanna, I want you to think back. Does anybody ever remember 20, 30 years ago of a memory daycare facility? I never even heard of it. And, and the point I'm making is what is going on right now in our society has never happened ever in the history of humankind. We have never had so many people losing their mind through dementia, losing their brains, their brain pathologies. This has never happened before. Is everybody with me? This has never happened on the scale of human history before. That's why this is such an important topic, okay? Let me tell you how bad it is. Now, when I say dementia, I'm just talking about cognitive decline, all those things that are included. But 5.3 million Americans, six leading cause of death. One out of three seniors are going to die from it. Every 66 seconds, uh, someone's diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's worse than prostate and breast cancer combined as far as how many people it kills. It's just off the chart how bad it is. And what if I say, start talking about diseases, if I said cancer, because this, you know, a lot of cancer is being talked about this month, um, everybody would say, yeah, cancer is probably the worst problem in the United States, right? Actually, you're nine times more likely to be diagnosed with cognitive decline or brain pathology than you actually are from any cancer. Did you know that? So this time of year, we always do a cancer killer makeover. We did this makeover because this is a much larger, much more serious, much more widespread issue for this population than any other population and any other disease. Does it make sense? And what you need to know is by the time you leave today that you are equipped so you do not have this. Is everybody with me? Raise your hand. Ooh, that mic is working. Raise this hand. Got it. Okay. Um, but watch this. We also spend nine times more as the government on dementia and related issues than we do cancer. And what's worse is it's going to triple by 2050. Do you think we can afford that? That's why everybody look at me and, and guys, uh, everybody uh, turn around, look at the camera, everybody wave. We're on Facebook Live right now. So Facebook Live, send this to every single person you know. Also, everybody here, What's going to happen is within about two and a half, three weeks, this is going to be edited. It's going to be put up on YouTube. And guess what I want you to do when you get that? Send it to every friend, every family that you have so you get this information out to every single person. Do you think people are going to get this information at their general physician? No. They will not get it there. I guarantee it. Okay? In fact, actually, if you don't learn something that radically goes against what's something you already learned, I probably didn't do my job today. Okay? So be open. Now, facts. This is a World Health Organization. What they say is dementia is not a normal part of aging. Now, everybody stop. Look at me. Everybody here, if you went to a general practitioner right now, a medical doctor, at some point in time, because this is what they've been taught, that uh, cognitive decline or dementia is a normal part of aging. Has anybody heard that? If I polled 100 people, guess how many people would think that? About 98, actually. It's about 98. Now, let me just say this. Dementia is as normal to aging as autism is to childhood. And it is, I can't, now in fact, you should hashtag that. Dementia is as normal to aging as autism is to childhood. It is not normal, it is not okay, it should not happen, and just because it's happening so much, if everybody's having something happen, doesn't mean it's normal, it just means it's common. And there's a difference between normal and common, and I want you to know that. And again, you look at the bottom, this is the World Health Organization. They basically say that, at the, you look at the last one, it says research that identifies the modifiable risk factors is scarce. Now everybody look at my face. That is an out and outright lie. I'm gonna show you one after another, one after another, the things that you can do today that didn't just seem like a good idea and a harebrained Dr. David idea. There's peer-reviewed, it's published journal articles, it's JMA, it's British Medical Journal, stuff that you can know right now decreases your risk factor for Alzheimer's, dementia, cognitive decline, and brain pathology starting today when you walk, actually starting today at break when you get green juices and all the rest. Everybody with me? Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Right? So you gotta unlearn and relearn and uh, one of the greatest quotes I ever heard were, the illiterate of today are the people who cannot unlearn and relearn because in the information technology, when you guys are exhausted with how much information you get, you're learning things that you're supposed to, quote, learn, not what you should learn, okay? And this is just not true, okay? Now, there are five signs to a early signs to declining brain. Now, you're going to hear a video later today that says the average person who starts having issues with the brain, it starts 20 years before you'll ever really catch on that it's happening. How, how often? How long? 20 years. 
20 years, what are some really early signs? And again, not just like brain things, it's not like a, like a thought process. This is like from psychotherapy and different therapies. This is some of the most common things. So number one, you forget where you put things. <laughs> now, some of you guys are getting ribbed by your spouse right now. But it's very common. It doesn't mean necessarily that you're already into dementia or you've got Alzheimer's or something like this. In fact, none of these are diagnostic 100%. But this is a really good, now some of you guys have noticed there's certain times in your life where you get this more, anybody? So when you're stressed more, when you've had loss of sleep more, and what all five of these are gonna show you, this is just signs that your brain is misfiring, right? If your knee is misfiring, what's the sign of it? It's kind of sore a little bit, it's pain a little bit, right? You don't have any pain receptors in your brain. So the only outward extension of you being able to have an experience of that is, um, where, where are my keys? I have no idea. Like, just a while ago, I was running around looking for my iPhone. I couldn't find it. Well, I didn't get much sleep last night, so this thing may not, like, the marbles may not be connecting. They're just rolling around by themselves, the two of them that I have. Uh, next, you have difficulty remembering conversations you recently had or things you just read, right? So very, very classic. In fact, this is a little bit further down the line, possibly a little bit, too. Um, you forget what you wanted to say mid-sentence. Uh, this is really classic. In fact, actually, people that are, are really deep into things will actually stop themselves right in the middle of a sentence, and they won't finish it, and then they don't even remember what they were about to say. Uh, but this often happens to a lot of us. I mean, it's happened to me occasionally in conversations if I'm really tired or I've had a hard workout or something. You stumble on words, suffering from lapses in concentration, also looking for words, right? So you're, you're, you're talking about something, and you're like, um, what's that? Um, come on, you know the word. You know what I'm talking to say, Right? That's what that is. You're laughing right now because I'm talking to you. And so we all have this, okay? Last but not least, you experience regular brain fog. And brain fog is just, it's, you're having a hard time concentrating. Uh, a lot of people have this early in the morning. You're not awake yet, which is also is a sign. It's maybe the sixth sign of your body, really, your brain having issues. It doesn't wake up fast. It takes a long time to get things going. Uh, and a lot of you guys are, are so hooked on, um, like, coffee or caffeine or some kind of a, adrenal stimulant that your brain doesn't start working until you get some of that to begin with. Uh, but again, brain fog, what is it? It's not a diagnosis. It's just a collection of symptoms, okay? So no one's, talk, no one's talking about it medically, but it can be really frightening if you have issues with it commonly and just and regularly, so brain fog. Now, dementia, Alzheimer's, brain aging. Now, there's some more stats in this, but I want you to get it because I want you to see how far-reaching this is. And everybody look, everybody look, look up here. No one's gonna leave with fear today. Like, I want you to be encouraged. No one's gonna have fear, but if you don't understand that if you don't do something different than everybody else, that I'm talking to you, that this is going to be you. Like right now, just look, if you even live to 80, it's one out of two. Raise your hand if you'd like to take a quarter out of your pocket and flip it, and one side says uh, dementia or Alzheimer's and not knowing your name or who you are anymore, and literally that being your odds of being that. Does that make sense? Nobody wants that, and so we want to make sure that it doesn't get you there. And so it's a one out of eight chance. Are you ready, babe? So I'm going, to, I'm going to turn this over to her, but I want to leave you with one big thing, okay? I want to leave you with the fact that for the rest of today, I'm going to challenge you on what it is that you take notes on, okay? I'm going to challenge you on what you take notes on and what you take home. Everybody look. So raise your hand if you think that you can write more than eight things down to leave with to begin with today. You can write more than eight things down, okay? Now, raise your hand if you can write more than five. I saw some people not raise their hands. Good. So, so I think I got five to eight in there. Okay, so one of the things I want to show you here up on the stage is the key to becoming brain fit lies within the five essentials. How many of you like a real testimony of what, you know, people experience when they get free as far as their brain is concerned? Give everybody, a, give, give Dorota a round of applause. Come on over here, Dorota. So Dorota is going to share with you an awesome testimony. Um, so the first thing we want to um, know really is, can you tell everybody what you were experiencing before we knew you, before you came into the office? What was going on with your health? Okay, to make your story really short and quick and sweet, hopefully, um, before I met or even knew about Maximize Living and definitely uh, Arab Family Wellness, um, it wasn't fun. I had a brain heavy metal toxicity, which I wasn't aware of, and it was for decades. I started probably at age eight and was continuing. I'm 54 right now. So 
the symptoms were mostly in my brain and my emotions. Mm. Brain functions were extremely diminished. I had a hard time keeping any conversation, meaning understanding what someone was talking to me about. Uh, you know I'm bilingual. It's Polish and English, both languages. I have exactly the same problem. Yeah. I couldn't rem remember faces of people who I talked, and I knew that I should remember them by face at least, because I know in the same place we worked week before, and week before, and week before, and week before. So that was one. What about your daughter? Like. Like every single mother, you want to be the best. And your child is the best. When I started to heal, when I was with, uh, when I started doing my uh, protocols, I didn't know how much I, I lost because I didn't remember. I'm so happy my husband is a crazy photograph uh, guy and we have tons of pictures. Mm -hmm. Because of that, I have memories. So tell everybody, you know, fast forward, you came into the office about six years ago. What, how has life changed for you since you, you know, started Herb Family Wellness? You started doing the five essentials that we're going to talk about today. First of all, I can learn. I remember, mostly. Um. We'll clap for that one, <laughs> right? I, I'm able to process any type of conversations. Uh, I can recall from what's happened in the past during the conversation when before it was just blank, it was nothing there, it was just blank. And you know when you, you, when you have any type of dementia, you're just not aware of it, so it's fun. You don't remember, you don't care, you, you're good. Um, right now, because of leaving Five Essentials, and it wasn't just here on and off, it was probably 99% most of the time, it changing, it was changing my life for better and better and better. And I know I'm not stopping. I know I will be keep going. And my goal at this point is when I will be 60, I will be on all level of health. I will be at age 30. That's what I want. That's my goal. That's, That's where I want to be because I know I can. That's good. So tell everybody, um, you know, you, you've been to other chiropractors even before you came to us. How is our office different? Okay. Um, who, everyone who knows uh, maximize living, we know we are getting, we are looking for cause of the problem. Now, me and my husband, we spent years of um, being treated by chiropractors who are dealing with symptoms. And unfortunately, one of them uh, told me then I need to go to psychiatrist. And you know very well how that will end it up. Mm -hmm. Thanks God, I, for some reason, it wasn't in my gut and I didn't want to go to psychiatrist. I know the answers are different and I was looking for. It made me to move to Texas to find <laughs> our family awesome. wellness. And that's why I am healed. Okay, so there's people gonna be sitting in here today. They've never been here. They don't know who we are, they've never been in the office, or maybe they have loved ones at home they didn't bring. What would you tell them? Don't wait. Don't wait. It will be harder. It will be more difficult. It will be longer. It will be more expensive. Or it might be not enough time. Hmm. I don't think you can, I, I know I couldn't afford anything else. I don't care how much it costs. If you have to sell your house, sell your house. It's what is important, your life or stupid house. I'm sorry, but that's my opinion. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Good job. Steve Newport's Alzheimer's disease has slowed considerably. Some of his symptoms even reversed, thanks to an unlikely treatment prescribed by his wife, Dr. Mary Newport, a physician who runs a neonatology ward at a Tampa, Florida hospital. She became determined to help her husband after he failed the so-called Alzheimer's clock test. He drew a few little circles and uh, several numbers, just in a very random pattern, didn't really look anything like a clock. And the doctor pulled me aside and she said, you know, he's actually on the verge of severe Alzheimer's at this point. He's uh, beyond moderate. So um, 
That was very, very devastating news. Dr. Newport began learning everything she could about her husband's disease. It appears to be a type of diabetes of the brain, um, and it's a process that starts happening uh, at least 10 or 20 years before you start having symptoms, and it's very similar to type 1 or type 2 diabetes in that you develop um, a problem with insulin. In this case, insulin problems prevent brain cells from accepting glucose, their primary fuel. Without it, the cells eventually die. But there is an alternative fuel, ketones, which the cells easily accept. Ketones are metabolized in the liver after you eat medium-chain triglycerides, which are found in coconut oil. So Dr. Newport added coconut oil to Steve's diet. Just two weeks later, he took the clock test again and, as you can see, demonstrated stunning improvement. I thought at the time, was it just good luck? Was it a lot of prayer? Was it the coconut oil? And I thought, well, we're going to keep the coconut oil going. Then three weeks later, he took the clock test a third time and continued to get better. And it wasn't just intellectually. He also improved emotionally and physically. He was not able to run. He was able to run again. He couldn't read for about a year and a half. But after somewhere around two or three months, he was able to read. Instead of being very sluggish, not talking very much in the morning, he would come out you know, with energy and talkative and joking, and he could find his water and his utensils. Dr. Newport documented Steve's success in a book called Alzheimer's Disease, What If There Was a Cure? She received this stack of thank you letters from other people whose loved one's Alzheimer's was helped after they followed Steve's diet. And while coconut oil is encouraging, there's actually something much more powerful. A team of biochemists led by Professor Kieran Clark at England's Oxford University have developed a ketone ester that packs a punch ten times greater than coconut oil. It reaches quite considerably higher levels and, and you can get whatever levels you want depending on how much you drink. The problem is they need millions of dollars to mass produce it. Very expensive and so we can't make very much of it ourselves. And what we would like is funding so that we could actually scale up and, and make it. But of course, there's no real profit in manufacturing stuff like that. So until a high potency ketone ester is available to the general public, coconut oil is still a good ketone source. Just make sure it's pure, non-hydrogenated. Avoid any hydrogenated oil, which is the same thing as dangerous trans fat. Many people avoid coconut oil because they think it's bad for them, but it's actually very healthy. Dr. Beverly Teeter is a researcher at the University of Maryland who specializes in dietary fats. She says years ago, coconut oil was criticized for raising cholesterol. But scientists have since learned there are two kinds of cholesterol, LDL, the bad kind, and HDL, which is very good for you and is the kind coconut oil raises. So they put out the message that it increased serum cholesterol, but the truth of the matter was it was helping the profile of the serum cholesterol. That never has been corrected in the public press, and um, I think that's the reason people have misconceptions about it. So not only does coconut oil improve your cholesterol levels, Dr. Teeter says the way it helps the brains of some Alzheimer's patients can be extended to people with Parkinson's disease, ALS, epilepsy, dementia, even schizophrenia and autism. And one more thing, coconut oil is a natural antibiotic that also helps kill viruses like HIV and herpes viruses. But the coconut oil tends to keep the bacteria down so that if you're assaulted with the virus, your immune system can concentrate on the virus. It doesn't have to concentrate on 27 other bacteria that you may have been exposed to that day. So consider coconut oil to improve your overall health and perhaps even go so far as to stave off life-threatening diseases. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lori Johnson, CBN yeah, News.
Um, I want to make sure we cover two very important essentials. Essential three is maximizing your quality nutrition. And so we're going to talk about the nutrition you need to stay away from, right? It's really even, not even really called nutrition, but the foods you need to stay away from. And we're going to hit on the foods that you really need to make sure you consume a lot. And then the other thing we're going to hit on is the toxicity, toxins that you have been exposing yourself to either willingly or unwillingly, knowingly, unknowingly, right? And so we're going to hit that and make sure you guys take some notes on this section. But what I want to make sure to touch on is if you guys, did, did you hear the part where he said 20 years? He said 20 years, this has been developing for 20 years, right? So if there was a test that you could do, that you could actually know whether you are actually showing some of the signs of this, this um, diabetes in the brain, the sh blood sugar imbalance thing they're talking about, and also this, this body being inflamed and starting to attack itself, wouldn't you want to do that test? That's actually what we do in the office, and it's called metabolics, okay? How many of you have had your metabolics done, okay? Not enough, right? But this metabolics testing, I'll actually show you what it is, is a blood and a urine test. And the blood and the urine test actually will give us a whole lot of information about whether you are setting yourself up for an autoimmune disease, an Alzheimer's, a Parkinson's, the things that we just talked about here, dementia and things like that. If you look here at this slide, we, it shows actually a patient who on the left-hand side had a biomarker called Indican, and that biomarker marker actually showed that this patient had a leaky gut problem going on. So even if they were trying to eat good foods, maybe they you know, heard some good information and they started like you guys are hearing today, and they started trying to make some changes like you guys are going to be doing today, this person has leaky gut. That means that they're not absorbing the nutrients, okay? They're not getting the benefits of the foods that we're going to talk about. In addition, the slide that you'll see on the right-hand side, those biomarkers right there show indications of inflammation and autoimmune disease. Okay, so this particular patient actually came to me with autoimmune type of symptoms. She also, she had brain fog really bad, very, very bad allergies. That was one of her, her biggest issues, really, um, that, she, that bothered her the most was the fact that she had these really bad allergies. And so what we did was we actually took her through a process for about 90 days. We put her on a, an eating plan that we're going to talk about. It's called the advanced plan. But we put her on the eating plan. And I'm going to talk to you about how to make sure you're doing the, the advanced plan correctly. But we put her on that. And then we actually went through some protocols to have actually heal her digestive tract, get rid of some of the stuff that was creating the leaky leaky gut syndrome, and after 90 days, we did a retest. And you can see on the left-hand side that Indican is actually not out of range anymore. We actually have moved into a healing of the gut, so she's actually absorbing the nutrients now, moving her away from the autoimmune, which you can also see the markers are cleared. On the right-hand side, all those are cleared. Those markers right there are all have all moved away from autoimmune, Alzheimer's, dementia, all those disorders that we're concerned about, we've moved away from that. Now, how many of you know any doctor out there that will tell you that you are actually going to heal from a diagnosis of some kind as opposed to keeping you on a medication the rest of your life? How many of you? Do you know that? I mean, this is actually incredible. More people need to know about this, that people can actually heal. Your body can heal from a, di from a diagnosis that is a doomsday diagnosis where they take your hope away. That's what this test is very powerful to do. Again, it's called metabolics, and that'll be one of the things that they'll have in the back today that is going to be 15% off. So you want to make sure you pick that up. This is another patient here that this patient came in to see me, and she came in to see me um, post-cancer treatment. So she had cancer, and she went through the, the typical standard chemo and radiation. And what you can see on her test is actually another autoimmune. So she's got the inflammation markers on there. And she also has a brain fog marker on there. And so in addition, there's the marker on the bottom that you can see on the, the bottom right here in red. That's a cancer marker that lets us know that our, the body's actually actively trying to build cancer cells. 
and it's when there's more cancer cells than healthy cells that we tip the scales and we start to get a diagnosis, okay? So not only did she go through chemo and radiation, but she's also still in the throes of dealing with a diagnosis that she never really got rid of. So she came to me and she had chemo brain really bad. This marker right here that you can see um, called kinurate, the first one that's circled in the red on the top right, that marker tells me of, that there is a direct impact on the brain. The body is attacking the brain. And what happens with autoimmune is your body actually starts to make antibodies against your own tissue. That's kind of demonic, isn't it? Like, you're fearfully and wonderfully made, and now suddenly your body's making antibodies to fight itself, whether it's your skin, your joints, your brain. That's what's happening in this particular patient. So after I put her through a protocol, you know, she did have the brain, she had the chemo brain. After I put her through a protocol of 90 days again for her, it was amazing. In fact, when she came to see me as a result of the chemo that she went through, she actually um, not only, you know, lost her hair, but all of her fingernails and her toenails were black. And so when she went through the protocol we had her on, she actually started getting nutrients in the system, started dumping the chemo, you know, chemo brain toxicity that she had off, off of her body, and she started to heal. And you could see where her toe, toenails had grown out. Half of the toenail that was the dead part, half of it had grown out, and the other half was all new toenail tissue. Now, I know that probably sounds a little small, but to me and to her, that was like, I'm going to live and I'm not going to die, right? And so can I get an amen to that, amen. right? So that's really important and that's really powerful. That's what this, um, that test does. Again, it's metabolics and it's a blood and urine test. And if you haven't done it, make sure you pick that up. That should be one action step that you put on your to-do list. Because if this video that we just saw a minute ago showed 20 years, this guy had been developing 20 years prior Alzheimer's, and now he can't draw a clock, right? He can't figure out where the utensils go in the drawer. I have a patient who, when she came to see me, she couldn't use the clicker. She didn't know how to use the remote control to turn the channels on the TV. I mean, literal function, everyday function, had completely been lost. And so now what we want to get into is we want to talk about the six routes to Alzheimer's disease. So if you're going to try to bake a cake, right, and it's like your best cake ever, your favorite cake, this is not a cake you want to bake, right? This is, these are the things that we're going to, I'm going to talk to you about right now that actually is baking the Alzheimer's type of a cake, okay? And so the first thing is that type 3 diabetes. This is actually, have you, have you guys ever heard of this, type 3? Who, raise your hand if you ever heard of this. I have like maybe five, six of us, right? So type 3 diabetes is actually a phrase that they're coining for Alzheimer's. And so what does that tell us? That tells us that eating a lot of what? Sugar. Sugar can contribute to what? Alzheimer's, right? Dementia, okay? So these are the types of things that we want to know about, and we want to make sure we start to transform and change some of the diet that we're consuming and the sugar that we're consuming. And we want to make sure that we know how, I'll show you here in a minute, how to read labels so you know whether you actually are consuming sugar. But this is a huge action step, guys, and this is in your own hands. You can do this. This is not the cake you want to bake. You do not want to bake the Alzheimer's cake. And it's totally in your own hands to actually cut the sugars out. And today, what you're going to be eating, you know, when we have our break here, we're going to feed you probably many of you the best meal that you've had all week. It may be possible because of the high fat and the nutrients that you're going to get in, in your body and, and good for your brain, okay? So this is type 3 diabetes. Now, number two, part of that cake that we're talking about we don't want to bake, right, the routes to getting Alzheimer's, is gut dysfunction. Well, how in the world do we get gut dysfunction? What contributes to that? Again, what's the thing we just said we need to stay away from? Sugar. sugar. Okay, so we're talking about sugar. We're talking about processed foods. What, you know, processed foods like the packaged foods that we want to quickly throw in the microwave, that kind of stuff, the processed foods. We also, if you can see the picture on the bottom there, that's a picture of, you know, what we see as far as the crops and the toxins that are actually being sprayed all over all of our crops, right? So these are the types of things that 
you know, Monsanto's putting out there by spraying all of our crops and supposedly making us healthier, right? And it's actually causing a lot of gut dysfunction. So, you know, action step number two to bake this cake we don't want to bake is gut dysfunction. So these are the foods that we want to stay away from to actually heal the digestive tract. Number three would be trans fat consumption. So when I was a kid, my job was to cook. I think I've told some of you before. And so my mom worked in a factory in General Motors. My dad was in construction. And so when I got off the school bus every day, my job was to, to actually come home and cook. And so I would come home, and the first thing I would do is I would go in the kitchen, and I would reach under the sink, and I would grab this coffee can, and I would put it up on the countertop. Who knows what's in the coffee can? Bacon fat, right? Lard, Wesson, what, what, what is it? Like, right? Crisco? Right? Interestingly enough, you can put it under your cabinet and the mold doesn't want it. But we're going to eat it, right? Now, a little plug for my mom. She's going to be 80 this year. She'd probably kill me that I said that. But she's actually one of the healthiest 80 year olds that I know. And she's, she's got her, her brain about her. You know, she walks a big dog. She organizes her whole neighborhood to play cards. We play euchre in Michigan. That's a big deal is cards. And so bowling and things like that. She's just very active. And so, you know, we don't do that anymore. What we do now is we get rid of the, you know, the, the, uh, the lard under the sink. And we actually use what? What's the oil we should use instead? Good job. Good crowd. Coconut oil. Very good. Okay, so we want to stay away from the trans fats. Again, that's in packaged foods. You saw the little video where it showed the partially hydrogenated, right? So anything that you see on the back that has partially hydrogenated corn oil, cottonseed oil, soybean oil, sunflower, all that partially hydrogenated, that's the stuff you want to stay away from. In fact, what you will also find is that kind of stuff is in your vitamins too. So some of you, you're going to go home and an action step that you might write on your list is you look in your vitamin cabinet. And I know you're trying to save money, but many of you are actually taking some of these vitamins that have the partially hydrogenated in them, and they're actually cheap way to build this cake we don't want to build, right? So that's one thing we want to make sure that we do is stay away from that stuff, okay? Now, we also want to pay close attention to the imbalance between our omega-3s and our omega-6s. What they want the ratio to be between your omega-6s and your omega-3s is it really should be like a 1 to 1 or maybe even a 5 to 1. 3 to 1 I've heard as well. So let's just say between 1 to 1 and 5 to 1 would be in a range that's healthy for your brain. We know your brain is made up of mostly what? Fat, fat right? So like Dr. David said, fat head, right? It's made up of mostly fat. So what we don't want to do is we don't want to buy into the no fat, low fat stuff that you hear out there, right? You know you're lied to about that, right? Do you, do you guys know that? You've been lied to about the no fat, low fat. Because the facts remain, we've been doing that for about 20 years, and we're actually about 50% obese now. So if that was working, then we would be healthier, right? So we want to stay away from that. The omega-6 to 3 ratio, again, either 1 to 1 to 5 to 1. Now, what the average ratio is right now to everybody that's sitting, let's just say, outside of here, <laughs> is about 50 to 1. 50 to 1. Now, how does that happen? Well, I've got to make sure that I stop off at my favorite fast food, you know, and I meet my girlfriends, or I take my kids there so they can play in the playground, right? And we, we love the French fries at McDonald's, so we've got to go there. And we, we like Chick-fil-A because, you know, Christians own the company, so we should probably support that, right? Okay, so, right? Are you guys hearing me? We're eating this type of stuff. Or what you're seeing is also at the workplace, that's a big one. I hear this a lot. I hear, I hear my family gets together and eats every weekend, and I have to eat what they make. I hear that a lot, right? Well, my answer is, then make an advanced plan meal from the cookbook that we, you know, the Maximum Living Nutrition Plan cook. Make a recipe from there, and let's actually start participating to your family members being healthier, right? So let's do that. Let's make that an action step. But I hear that, and I hear it at workplace. 
you know, at work, they've got the cookies and the, all that stuff on the countertop, and so I have to, you know, I, I don't want to insult somebody. But what you're doing is you're contributing to that 50 to 1 ratio by doing that, and that's actually pushing us to the autoimmune disease and the cake we don't want to bake, right? Okay? So the next one is flu shots and environmental toxins. I'm going to finish out my section today before we have a break, and I'm going to talk about environmental toxins, and you're probably going to have some questions, so I'm going to give you the phone number here shortly to show you. You can, text, you can type in even Facebook Live people. You can text in your questions, and we'll answer those at the end of this section. This is a heavy topic. I actually see patients. In fact, just this past week, I had somebody come in, and they have actually were really proud to put on their paperwork that they've had 20 flu shots. 20 flu shots. Okay, now listen. No condemnation. They think they're doing the right thing, right? They do. They're following the instructions of their doctor. But Hugh Fundenberg, who actually has over 800 peer-reviewed journal articles, and he's the most cited immunologist out there, he says that if you receive five consecutive flu shots, you're 10 times more likely to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease. Now think about that. How many people do you know in cognitive decline? We're actually being forced almost many times to do this flu shot, right? We're forcing these, you know, even pregnant women, we're forcing them to do it, right? You've got to do that if you're pregnant. You've got to do that. You're a bad mom if you don't, right? But I'm here to tell you, don't do that. That's another lie you're being told, okay? We are fearfully and wonderfully made, and God didn't leave us alone and abandon us without everything that we need to be able to heal and fight off everything that there is out there. And this is one of those things. Don't buy into the, turn the commercials off on the TV, flip the channel, don't buy into that crap, okay? This guy knows what he's talking about. And if you're in my office in a, in a daily basis or you just talk to my team members, you'll hear the burden on the heart of my team members when they hear parents talking about how their kids you know, one day they were really smart, they were gifted, and then the next day they were gone. This is part of it. This whole pushed, forced vaccine thing, instead of taking it and putting it back into the parents' hands where they can make the decision for the health and the well-being of their child. This is something, don't get caught up into this. Don't, we are lied to about this, and I'm here to expose the lie. This is not a cake you want to bake, okay? And then the last thing on baking a cake toward pushing yourself toward Alzheimer's is lack of power. What do I mean by lack of power? Lack of power to your brain. How does your brain get power? Something to think about, right? Okay, we got an electricity. Well, how do we charge the brain up? Did you guys know that 90% of the stimulation, electrical circuitry, charge, power to your brain comes from the joints of your spine. The joints of your spine. That means that if the joints of your spine are out of alignment, are you charging this battery? You're not charging the battery, right? So we're going to talk about that. Dr. David will hit more on that and what you can do for that. And he's also going to hit on the exercise component. Listen, the dreaded exercise just because you don't want to do it doesn't make it essential. It's no less essential just because you don't want to do it. You, you've got to power the battery, right? And exercise is one of those pieces. Okay, so who has notes? Did you write, write some things down? Okay, good. I see some hands waving around. Okay, another really important note. Now, did you guys note in the video where they talked about ketones, right? Did you guys note that? Okay. So ketones, the brain really likes ketones. Well, guess what type of eating plan that you need to follow to make sure the brain gets what it needs so that it actually doesn't bake the cake we were talking about. We want to make sure that the percentages look like this. Now, this is totally contrary to what we're normally being told, right? It's totally contrary to what we're normally doing, too. Most of us are doing 65% what? Carbs, sugars, right? That's most of us, that's what we're doing, which is why we're contributing to type 3 diabetes that way, right? Which is going to push us toward the dementia, the Alzheimer's route, okay? So what we want to do, put these percentages down, and I'm going to unpack these percentages so that you know what kind of fat, what kind of protein, what kind of carbs. This is a really important ratio, and we're going to find out who needs to follow this ratio. 
Again, going back to the test that I talked to you about, the metabolics test, that test tells me beyond a shadow of a doubt how you've been eating. There's nowhere to hide. It will tell me. Okay? It also tells me what you need. Okay? And so moving on, core plan, take a snapshot of this one for people who would like to follow a plan that maybe they don't have a serious issue, but maybe, maybe for children that don't have a health-related issue, this would be a percentage ratio. So pay attention to the percentages here. But the percentages in the last one that you'll see, you can see 65 to 77% fat, which is beneficial for what? Brain. Brain, right? Okay, so... Who needs what plan? What you're going to find, for those of you, if you don't have this book, um, for Facebook Live users, you can go to herbfamilywellness.com and just click on the store. And in our store, there's actually a chiropractic section, and you can pick up some of these books and the supplements that you won't be able to pick up today. But in this, we have an eating plan. One's called the core plan, and one's called the advanced plan. The advanced plan is the one that's going to help us to prevent the whole Alzheimer's thing from happening, okay, and all the other disorders from happening. And you can see on there inflammation. You can see the icon. The arrow is pointing up. Now, eating this way, do you think it'll be easy starting out? Is it going to be easy? No. No, it's not going to be easy. Do you think you might be cranky by day four? You're going to be cranky by day four. You're probably going to even say a few cuss words about me, right? You're going to want to quit by day five, right? But guess what? By about two weeks into this plan, how many of you experienced this before? I need by a show of hands, how many of you have experienced unbelievable benefits by following the advanced plan when we're talking about joints and weight loss? Raise your hands. Look around. Okay. Okay. There's so many people in here who have actually done this. Now, it wasn't easy, but guess what? You're worth it. You're worth it. Now, who needs it? How do I know if I'm in that 20-year, you know, group where I'm, like, you know, developing it and I haven't taken the metabolics test yet, okay? So then if you have any of these symptoms or if you've ever taken medication for any of these things... Or maybe your doctor told you to be on medication, and you're not, but you actually have some of these symptoms, okay? Anybody in the triglyceride, cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar category, if you are in that category, or you have a loved one that you didn't bring today, and they're in that category, then guess which plan we need to follow? I'm going to tell you what the plan consists of here shortly. I'm going to give you the steps of it, but what, what plan should we follow? Say it louder. Very good. Advance. That's right. Now, if you have some form of toxicity, like Dorota was talking about, like a heavy metal toxicity, maybe you've been around mold, maybe you have Lyme, something like that, that you've, you know, had some sort of toxic exposure, sick building syndrome, anything like that, maybe inflammatory disease you know you have, or maybe allergies, that's a big one, or arthritis. Your joints are just in terrible pain, okay? Then you should follow what plan? The advanced plan. And this plan is high in what? Fat. Fat. That's right. Okay. The right-hand side, autism spectrum disorder. That's a lot of different types of things falls in that category, right? But one of the best things for a child's brain is to give them more what? Fat. In fact, it's interesting to me how my daughter, she was always, would always gravitate toward butter. She would just look at me and like take the spoon and just, just, and sometimes take the stick of butter and just start honking on the butter. Now think about that. Innately and instinctively, that is such a great thing, right? As long as it's grass-fed, right? And it's not, you know, the cows weren't grazed poorly where they have all kinds of, you know, bad stuff in them, right? So instinctively, that's already an amazing thing. And they actually even say for kids on the spectrum, one of the things that they should do is eat butter, right? It's the same kind of premise with the coconut oil, same type of thing. It's the fat. That's the whole reason behind that. Now, cancer, anybody who has had a diagnosis of cancer ever, or maybe you're currently battling cancer, what is the number one thing that cancer cells like and it makes more cancer? Sugar, now you guys said it. You can't get mad at me. (laughs) 
Sugar, that's exactly right. So the reason why we know this is because they use a PET scan, right? And the PET scan is where they actually test for cancer. You guys know that, right? So it's a scan that they make you drink, um, you know, radioactive sugar. So you drink it. And the whole goal behind that is the sugar is radioactive and it goes to the places where you have cancer. And when you do the scan, it lights up on the scan. Okay? So that means sugar will go to the areas where you have what? Cancer, right? So we want to stay away from can we want to stay away from sugar. We don't want to promote that. So cancer, if you're that person, then you're going to want to stay on this plan and we're going to talk about here the advanced plan, okay? Fibromyalgia, heart disease, digestive dysfunction, obesity, uh, intolerant to grains. What about the whole ADD, ADHD, and mental emotional challenges? This particular person, do they do good on sugar? But do they like sugar? Yes. They like it, right? So it causes them to do this whole, oh, I don't feel so good. Huh. I'm really, really happy right now and crash. Now I want to cry and stay in my room all day and maybe fight somebody. And then, right, back up again with a big old sugar surge and then back down again, right? This creates and, and actually perpetuates the whole emotional imbalance, right? So for people like that, we should give them some almonds, right? Or give them a scoop of coconut oil, right? We want to actually move them toward high fats, right? Now the last thing on here is medications. What you'll find is when you start going through these protocols, you'll go back to your doctor and your doctor will be like, what are you doing? Because you're getting so much better and you're going to find that your doctor will take you off your medication successfully because your lab values look so good. That's the kind of stuff that will happen. And how many of you would like to be able to get off some of the crappy medications you don't want to be taking, right? Right? So that's actually going to be a really positive benefit for you to be able to follow this. Now, what are the steps? Step one, two, three. Step one, two, three. We're going to write them down. Cut your carbs, fix your fats, and perfect your proteins. Cut your carbs, fix your fats, and perfect your proteins. This is where I'm going to give you the phone number, so you can write the phone number down because we're going to actually have some questions, I think, moving through the rest of this section that you can send. Everybody got it? Yep, we'll go back. Cut the carbs, fix your fats, and perfect your proteins. When we do this, we bake a very different cake, yeah? Right, when we do this, okay? Questions, everybody got the phone number? Okay, so we're gonna go into, if I can, cut the carbs. How many of you know what insulin is also known as? The AKA for insulin, what is it also called? Because you know insulin's that medication they give people who are, quote, diabetic, right? So what is the other name for insulin? It's also called the fat hormone. Awesome. I get to take this medication and get what? Fat. fat. Awesome. So cutting the carbs, we want to make sure that we're looking at the amount of sugar that we're intaking so that we take the stress off our own body's ability to be able to, you know, secrete from the pancreas our own insulin and maybe bring it back online so we can heal the pancreas through this process. So we want to cut the carbs, and that's actually going to be an important process. When we do that, did you see the image there of the aging? See that process, that process of aging that happens when we eat high sugar? And you can see here the image, the lady on the left, and even look at the hands. You can see how old somebody is when you look at that, and that's actually because of the choices we're making with a lot of the foods that we're, and again, some of us are doing it not knowing. Okay? After today, you will know. Okay? So the other thing, too, check the brain out. How does that brain look eating a lot of sugar? Right? That's the aging process of the brain. That's what will happen with the brain. Now look at this guy. That happens in a matter like that. How many of you know people who they say they're 40 and they look 60? Right? This is what happens when we cut the carbs. We can actually reverse that process. Now, check out the 
again, we talked about reading labels, okay? So you want to make sure you're reading labels, okay? When you get your labels of your favorite drinks, your juices and things like that, turn the label around, look at where it says other ingredients on there, and you'll see, look on this right here. This is supposed to be like a, like a uh, what do they call it, a orange marmalade, right? And so the main ingredients that you'll see on there, the first one is what? Sugar, right? And so as you go down through there, you'll see you know, glucose, fructose, syrup. You'll see gelling agents and caramelized sugar. What caramelized sugar? I mean, caramelized sugar? What's OK, so caramelized sugar. And the interesting thing about this is this portion size, there's 65 grams of sugar. Now, do the math. You might want to write this formula down. Divide that by four, and that tells you how many actual teaspoons are in the glass that you're drinking. Divide it by four. We're talking about 15-ish, 15, 15. So how many of you would take a glass and just scoop 15 teaspoons into the glass and then just put maybe a little water in there? How many of you would really do that? But this is what's happening. When we drink some of these drinks, we don't even know how much sugar is in them, right? What should we be drinking a whole lot of? Water, right? So this is the stuff we want to pay attention to. When we start looking at other ingredients, we're going to shop very differently. We're going to take you, give you an opportunity to go shopping. Dr. D is going to take you shopping so you can learn how to read these labels and how to do this and actually be able to know what you're looking at, like know what you should be choosing. Now what's worse than this is actually artificial sugars, okay? We probably could take our purses right now out and open them up and we could find all kinds of gum and mint and candies, right, that has all these artificial sweeteners, our sports drinks, you know, we think that are actually the 2% or the, the no sugar when it says diet. It usually means aspartame. Now, guys, we're actually not getting skinnier or healthier from using this stuff. In fact, what it's doing is it's actually burning a hole in our brain and we don't even know it. And so we want to pay very close attention to these artificial sweeteners. The companies are trying to get smart and they're trying to change the names so that you know, they think we've bought onto aspartame, so they're going to try and start changing some of the names. We've got to pay very close attention to this. But what's interesting is you'll see the BMI and the artificial sweeteners chart. So you can kind of see how the artificial sweeteners are going up and you can see the use of the percentage, like how we're using it on the bottom. And look at our BMI. Our BMI, is it getting lower or is it getting higher? The BMI is just getting higher, so we're just getting fatter as we use these artificial sweeteners. It's not helping us. It's not contributing to health and lean body muscle mass, right? So this is even more dangerous. So what we recommend is no sugar, right? That would be the better option. But for those of you who actually like to have a little a little hint of something that has a little sweetness to it. Stevia is a flower. You can actually grow them in your house if you want to. We carry stevia in the office. And so those are some of the things that you can do. We want to stay away from the aspartames, the sucralose, and things like that. Now, we're getting into step two, fixing your fats. So we all saw the coconut in there, right? Right? Everybody saw the coconut. Well, we should be consuming more coconut and using that. Again, other good fats. So Take a look at the picture. What are some good fats? Avocado. avocado. I'm going to show you a smoothie here just in a little bit where you can actually put avocados in a smoothie. You can make ice cream with avocados. You can make pudding with avocados. You know, avocados we need to make sure we're consuming because they have all the good fats for our brain. Now, guess what? I'm from Michigan, and I'll tell you right now, I did not like avocados when I moved to Texas. I didn't like them. And so guess what? I learned to like them. I just learned to. And that's one of those things that when I know a truth, I'm going to change my mind and I'm going to find ways to learn to like things. So for those of you who are going to look at some of these things and say, but I don't like vegetables. I don't like avocados. You know, I will say this. You probably can have a talk with God about this because he did make the Garden of Eden and it is full of vegetables. And so that was for us to eat, right? So I just... You know, and I think you probably should try this. Just change your mind about it. For those kids out there who are like, I don't like this. Guess what? Change your mind about it. It's good for you, okay? Now, uh, optimal omega. Important. They have a kids and adults formula 
for those of us who know we have not been getting the good fats. If you're the, you know, the vegetable oil person who, you know, you had like me, like I was, you know, you're going to want to make sure you pick up your, your good fats, your optimal omega. That's going to improve cognition and brain function, okay? And we have the kids formula as well. So make sure you pick that up. Healthy fats, this is the cell membrane. So in your cell membrane, you have, you have all made up of what? Your cell membrane is made of mostly what? What is your cell membrane made of? It's mostly what? Fat, right? So if in your cell membrane, and your cell membrane is like a circle, kind of put your hands up like this, make a circle, okay? If that circle is your cell membrane of 30 trillion cells, and you're trying to get fat, good nutrients into the cell, and bad nutrients out of the cell, you do that when you have a healthy cell membrane. But when you eat the foods that we just talked about, like the trans fats, like the fast food, you guys see our McDonald's? We have a McDonald's demo in our office that's been there since 2007. 10 years and the french fries look exactly the same way they did when we first bought it. In fact, the interesting thing is the only thing decomposing is the receipt that's stapled to the bag. Right? The, the mold doesn't want it. So the french fries, the, the, the oils, no. So we actually have these cell membranes that we just talked about, and we eat foods like the french fries and the packaged foods, then what we do is we wrap saran wrap around our cells, and if I wrap saran wrap around all 30 trillion of your cells, can you get nutrients into those cells? Can you get toxins out of the cell? Then why can't you lose weight? Can you lose weight? Well, how about heal from a disease like cancer or dementia or Alzheimer? Can you heal? Right? So the cell membrane and the fat content that we just talked about and healing it is so critical for your well-being, for you to be able to heal from these different disorders. Now, the third one is perfecting your proteins. So what do I mean by perfecting your proteins? When you start following this eating plan, and we showed you the percentages, right? Who remembers the percentage of fat you should have? 65 to 77%, who remembers the percentage of protein, right, 15 to 25, and who remembers the carbs, 8 to 10, right? So when we see people follow this eating plan and we go back to the percentages, we see people say, well, I'll stay away from the sugar, but what they do is they compensate by increasing their protein. Now, can you see if you increase your protein intake, then what you're doing, if you use more than your body needs, on the left you'll see too much protein can lead to gluconeogenesis, which is a process of making more sugar, and you've actually done the same thing as if you just ate candy bars. So when you order that steak and it's like bigger than your plate, <laughs> and you, you know there's no way you're going to be able to eat all that, but you do anyway, what you're doing is you actually passed, after about a third of that steak, the amount of protein you needed, and the rest of it turned to what? Sugar. So we want to make sure that we know what kind of protein should we have. What are the proteins that we should have? Meat and, and dairy that's been raised what? Organically, grass-fed, no hormones injected, no antibiotics, no um, non-GMO, right? We want to make sure we're choosing things that are actually healthier sources. So be careful with this. That's why it says perfect your proteins. Now, for those of you who actually get grossed out by thinking about all this and you're like, ah, I'm just not going to eat meat, and then you just decide that you're not going to eat meat, so then you actually increase your carbs, right, and not enough meat, then you're the one that actually has the brittle hair, the weak fingernails and toenails, right, the muscle wasting, and you got skin breakouts, right? So we actually swing from one side to the other when we do this. We've got to make sure we have the right ratio and we perfect our proteins. They're clean sources of proteins, okay? What's the right amount? 25 to 30 grams per meal. So for those of you who like to measure, what does that look like for, you know, for those of you who don't want to measure? Just think about like the size of a deck of cards. That's about how much protein per meal or a scoop of the perfect protein like a scoop of the protein that we have, the grass-fed perfect protein that Maximize Living has, that's kind of about the right amount, okay, when you're trying to make sure to get the right amount of protein. Great recipe right here. I told you I was going to show you a recipe on how to boost your brain, brain-boosting smoothies. And again, yes, there's an avocado in there. Who's going to taste the avocado? 
I, you're not going to taste the avocado. You got blueberries in there. You're going to taste the blueberries. Okay? You're going to taste the sweet, the protein. Okay? So fantastic recipes. In fact, there, we have recipes on herbfamilyfoods.com. And we also have recipes in the cookbooks, the Maximize Living Nutrition Plan book. So for those of you who have those or you don't, those are the places that you can pick those up. Grass-fed whey protein. This is the protein I'm talking about. Many of you are buying cheap protein. And you're making smoothies with this cheap protein. And the protein is full of isolates. Everybody say isolates. 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 So it makes the protein cheap, and it's not a real authentic source of nutrition. So you want to stay away from isolates. This is going to be pure concentrated. The cheap stuff, guys, isn't always the answer. When we're talking about preserving our brain and our nerve system, you're going to pay one way or the other. You can either pay now and make a good choice where you're actually getting the right nutrition now, or you can pay later with a chronic illness, which I'd rather not, right? You're going to pay one way or the other. So make that choice to invest in the good nutrition now, okay, for your brain. Alzheimer's, dementia, and brain fog prevention strategies. Here's a couple other action steps for you. You may be allergic to some of these things. When I do that testing, the blood and urine testing, I found some people who had some lactose issues, some dairy issues. So we can see that on, on there. So you want to make sure that you know if you have issues in the area, stay away from those foods. Fantastic study, groundbreaking study that finds turmeric extract superior to Prozac for depression. I mean, this is incredible, right? Superior to Prozac for depression. Now, Maximize Living sells the daily defense. That's our product that does that, right? So you want to make sure you're increasing that. If you're suffering with anxiety or depression, make sure you're increasing your turmeric. Now, what I found is the manufacturer of our product actually told me that he tests a lot of products out there that are um, turmeric products. And he said that you can buy a cheap one, and it'll take you the whole bottle to get the amount of nutrition that's actually in one capsule of ours. So I don't like taking a whole bottle, but I like to know that. That's a very important fact because not every turmeric is made the same. Okay, very important to know. Now, what foods should you add for increasing your magnesium that's also helpful for brain? Okay, amazing. And again, a lot of dark leafy greens, right? Dark leafy greens, nuts and seeds, which you're going to have back in the back, beans and lentils and avocado. Foods for increasing for folate, right? That's one of the things they say for women to take when they're pregnant, right? Eat a whole lot of this when you're pregnant because it helps the, the brain develop in the baby, the nerve system develop in the baby. If you are one person who's been suffering with brain-related issues, then these are the foods you want to make sure you're consuming a whole lot of, okay? Yeah, take pictures of that, okay? Zinc, another one. And notice the top left, grass-fed what? Grass-fed, not, you know, inject, injected with antibiotics and conventionally made. Grass-fed beef is very important for increasing your zinc, which is, again, something very important for your brain. Now, I want to show you a fantastic video about vitamin D3. Check this out. Alzheimer's is one of the cruelest diseases, of course. There's no cure. So when a study came out today linking vitamin D deficiency to a higher risk of Alzheimer's and dementia, we wanted to know more. The study found that people who are moderately deficient in the so-called sunshine vitamin have a 53% greater risk of developing dementia. For those with a severe deficiency, the risk is more than double. Dr. John LaPook has been looking into this. And John, why a connection between vitamin D and Alzheimer's to begin with? Well, vitamin D controls a lot of cell functions. And uh, it's been found in the past that there are receptors to vitamin D throughout the body, almost everywhere, including in the memory centers of the brain. Now, initially, low vitamin D was linked to brittle bones. But in recent years, you've heard a lot of research about it being linked to other conditions like cancer, neurological problems, depression, and diabetes. Okay, so now the question everyone at home is shouting, should I take vitamin D supplements, and if so, how much? That's a tough one. 
Just because low vitamin D is linked to a condition doesn't mean that low vitamin D is causing it. So if your vitamin D level is very low, it's reasonable to try to get it up with, say, diet oily fish, getting out into the sun a little bit more, or supplementation. That may help prevent bone problems, but research has had a tough time showing that it helps prevent those other conditions that I mentioned. Now, I spoke to one of the authors of the paper, and he said he does not recommend giving people vitamin D as supplementation to help prevent dementia because it simply hasn't been shown to work. And we do know from other research that too much vitamin D is not great. It can cause kidney stones and a lot of other problems. And if you're deficient, a doctor can tell that with a blood test. Yes. John, thanks very much. So you guys know how much vitamin D that you should have? Like what is your level of vitamin D, what it should be? Who knows? Because your because your your lab's not going to tell you correctly and if you've had it tested, thank you. If you've had it tested before, they're gonna tell you you're in range when you're not. So what should the range be? 70 to what? To 90, right? Just think about a, a, a report card. 70 to 80 is like a, you know, like a C, 80 to 90 is like a B, 90 to 100. Stay in that range, then you're actually in the range where you should be. Check out the study, 498 older women who actually ingested less vitamin D per day had a much higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So if you ever have labs done, this is one of the most important labs to have done. If you don't have a place to get it done, check with my front desk at the office and they'll show you how to get your vitamin D tested. This is one thing you should test and test it every year. Know what your levels are and make sure you're in the 70 to 100 actual range, okay? Okay, good. So animal studies show vitamin D prevents Alzheimer's in two ways. This is so powerful. It stops the shrinkage and the atrophy of the part of your brain for memory. Here's what's interesting, guys. Many years ago, about a decade ago, in another office that I, in another location where we had an office, we actually tested all of our patients. And it was in June, and we're in Texas, right? So we would expect that we have a lot of sunshine. But what I found was really interesting is that 99% of the patients tested were vitamin D deficient. So what that tells us is that even though we're in Texas and it's June and there's lots of sun that we have access to, we're really not getting access to it. We're not taking advantage of it because most of us are working, we're inside, right? So it's very important to make sure, again, vitamin D, it's shrinking your brain, causing atrophy, the areas of your brain that's actually responsible for memory. And again, vitamin D triggers the breakdown and clearance of beta amyloid placking. That's the stuff that they talk about for Alzheimer's. Now, no drug is gonna do this, guys. There's not a drug out there that's gonna do this. So this is one of the critical vitamins that everybody should make sure that is part of their routine, vitamin D3. Now let's get to the toxins. Let's play our video on the toxins. I'm gonna to go ahead and do that one. A new study confirms the link between Alzheimer's and aluminum. The neurotoxin, which is present in household items like deodorant and tin foil, it accumulates in the body over time. Scientists now say lifelong exposure may be the reason why one in three seniors are dying with this disease. RT's Brigida Santos has the story today from Los Angeles. Brigida. Hi there, Simone. So one of the leading causes of Alzheimer's that scientists believe in is this idea of genetic predisposition. And this is something that has dominated Alzheimer's research for the past two decades. But the problem with this hypothesis is that only two to three percent of all Alzheimer's cases come from people who have a genetic predisposition, which means that scientists still don't know what causes sporadic Alzheimer's, meaning Alzheimer's in everybody else who may not have a genetic predisposition. As a result, they have slowly been looking more and more at potential causes uh, in the environment and other things that people are exposed to, like aluminum and even things that are in our diet. Now, earlier today, I spoke with Max Lugavere, who is a researcher on Alzheimer's as well as a filmmaker. Take a listen to what he had to say. There is a, a very strong association between aluminum exposure and risk for dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Um, I don't think that it's settled science for sure, but I also uh, don't think that we should be going out of our way to increase our exposure to aluminum. In the absence of a settled consensus, I think it's highly important to um, be mindful of these factors uh, today. You know, we have to make decisions about the things that we put into our bodies and that we put on our bodies today. And, you know, Alzheimer's and dementia 
These are uh, diseases that begin in the brain decades before the first symptom. Now, previous studies have already linked toxic metal exposure to other brain diseases, and that's because toxic metals cause oxidative stress in the brain, and aluminum is actually one of the worst culprits in this uh, capacity. And aluminum, as you said, is present in everything from our deodorant to foil to cans that we preserve our food in. It's also an environmental hazard for certain people in certain occupations. And this is something that researchers have been trying to link to Alzheimer's for a long time. Now, in this latest study, which was published in the Journal of Trace Elements in Medicine and Biology, researchers found that aluminum was present in brain tissues uh, of all of the subjects that they studied. Now, these subjects were people who had donated their bodies to science. They all died while suffering from Alzheimer's. Now, this brain bank is located at King's College in London, the brain bank where they took these uh, donors' tissues from. And what these researchers found was that aluminum was present in all 144 tissues, with concentrations ranging from low to high. 11 out of 12 of these people had at least one tissue with levels that were considered pathologically significant, and nine had levels considered pathologically concerning. Now, this study concludes that aluminum absolutely plays in the role of all in the role of Alzheimer's, uh, of some, if not all of them. And that's because they did find aluminum present in all of these people uh, with familial Alzheimer's in this case. Now, the author of this study says, quote, we should take all possible precautions to reduce the accumulation of aluminum in our brain tissue through our everyday activities, and we should start to do this as early in our lives as possible. Now, this is really important because the Alzheimer's Association says that uh, the disease is on the rise, and that in 2016 alone, 5.4 million Americans were suffering from Alzheimer's, and this includes people at all ages. And that's equivalent to one person becoming diagnosed about every 66 seconds, Simone. Brigida, that's an incredible discovery. RT correspondent Brigida Santos reporting for us from Los Angeles. Thank you. This is the one that I want to do. Okay, so we want to hit on the, the prevention, the monitoring your environmental toxins. I only have a couple left in this area, but you're going to want to make sure you write them down. We just hit on aluminum, right? What the heck do we consume? How do we get aluminum? How are we getting it so that every brain that they actually tested had aluminum in it? Well, I, there's no way I'll be able to touch on all of them, but I can give you a few of them. These are immediate action steps that you can take right away. In fact, getting into um, some of the foods, looking for these labels, the GMOs, let's hit on the pesticides. So the sprays that you're actually getting when you spray around your yard, spray on the inside of your house, the schools that are being sprayed, that's going to be one area we're going to see a lot of aluminum. But what else is toxic, right? What else is toxic we're being exposed to? The glyphosate that they spray on all the crops, you can kind of see the propensity of the glyphosate. And on the chart, you can also see celiac disease, which is a digestive disease. Again, not being able to absorb nutrients, then shuts down brain functions and cognitive function. And so, cool part about this, check this out. The amount of glyphosate in foods, what is the actual level that they say that's, quote, considered safe? So remember this, it's 0.1 parts per billion. Everybody say 0.1. 0.1. So what we're finding is if 0.1 parts per billion of glyphosate is the, quote, safe amount that's in our foods, check out the foods that we're consuming. You can see here Cheerios. I mean, I, when I was a kid, I had Cheerios, right? But check it out, 1,123, 25.3. Now, what did we say was safe? Point what? 0.1 parts per billion. This guy is over a thousand. Do you guys see? We're actually eating breakfast in the morning and we're killing our brain and we don't even know it, right? Because of the glyphosate that's being sprayed on all the crops. That's why the non GMO, the grass fed, make sure you check those labels and it says that. And the naturally, you know, the. Um, the or certified organic, make sure you're checking those things when you shop. Check out this slide, too. This actually shows the glyphosate. You can see the chart of glyphosate, but check out the number of cases of autism. Do you see? They're in the exact same pattern, the number of cases of autism. We also can see the number of cases of autoimmune diseases. Just in the past 20 years, look at what's happened to the number of cases of autoimmune diseases 
as it pertains to the glyphosate that's sprayed on all of our foods. So we've got to stay away from the, the packaged and the, the, we've got to make sure it's non-GMO and it's grass-fed. This kind of stuff. The other thing that we want to make sure that we pick, we're careful of for brain prevention strategies, so we just said make sure we're staying away from glyphosate, right? That kind of stuff. We want to stay, for, stay away from that. We also want to eliminate mercury. How do we get mercury in our body? Anybody know? We know we're getting them from fillings, right? The silver fillings. Don't let your doctor tell you that they're safe. They're not. Don't, they, because when they handle it, they actually have to be in a hazmat suit, and they discard it in a hazmat container, and it's picked up you know, that securely as well. So it shouldn't go in your mouth if, that's how they, if they can't handle it with their hands, right? So we want to stay. The other, way, the other place we're getting mercury in our bodies is how? Okay, fish, but what about vaccines? Right? That's one of the preservatives in vaccines. So again, mercury in vaccines, mercury in, in, in our silver fillings. So fish as well that's coming up with some of the bad fish that's out there. So you've got to be careful that you're actually getting good, clean sources. Now, what's the other area that we're getting toxins? Brain fog prevention strategy may be to take a very hard look at your pans that you're cooking with. I know Salad Master um, Food Saved Me is here. And Food Save Me has pots and pans. They actually test your pots and pans, and I have had mine tested. So this is a really important thing to make sure you do because we just talked about aluminum. And we cook all day long, so this is an area that we can actually protect our brain and eliminate the aluminum. Again, um, deodorants, that's another area. You know, making sure that you don't put deodorant underneath your arms, close to your breasts, and you're actually getting you know, disease, you know, breast cancer prevalence increases because of that, because of the aluminum. So we want to be careful of the uh, deodorants that we're, that we're using. So how many of you knew that the, these air fresher, fresheners also had these toxins in them as well? So you want to make sure those are not in your car, you're not putting the Glade plug-ins, those are things that are really toxic for your brain. Get those out. Those are fo brain fog prevention strategies, so make sure you get those out. Use essential oils. Young Living has amazing essential oils. Use essential oils if you want to give it, you know, put, you know, make things smell nicely. Again, avoiding the flu vaccines and drugs. And again, reducing and eliminating medications. Guys, the over-the-counter medications that's out there, there's no way I could go over all of them that have aluminum and mercury and have all these different types of toxins in them. You have to, you know, get the package insert, go online, start researching it. And then get your body healthy so that you never feel like you need these medications. That's really the goal. One way to change our genes is to make new ones, as Craig Venter has so elegantly shown. Another is to change our lifestyles. And what we're learning is how powerful and dynamic these changes can be, that you don't have to wait uh, very long to see the benefits. When you eat healthier, manage stress, exercise, and love more, your brain actually gets more blood flow and more oxygen. But more than that, your brain gets measurably bigger. Things that were thought impossible just a few years ago can actually be measured now. This was uh, uh, figured out by Robin Williams a few years before the rest of us. <laughs> Now, there's some uh, things that you can do to make your brain grow new brain cells. Some of my favorite things like chocolate and tea, blueberries, uh, alcohol in moderation, stress management, and cannabinoids found in marijuana. Um, I'm just the messenger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what were we just talking about? Um, <laughs> And uh, other things that can make it worse, it can cause you to lose brain cells, the usual suspects like saturated fat and sugar, nicotine, opiates, cocaine, too much alcohol, and chronic stress. Your skin gets more blood flow when you change your lifestyle, so you age less quickly, your skin doesn't wrinkle as much, your heart gets more blood flow. We've shown that you can actually reverse heart disease, that these clogged arteries that you see in the upper left, after only a year, become measurably less clogged. And the cardiac PET scan shown in the lower left, the blue means no blood flow. A year later, orange and white is maximal blood flow. We've shown you may be able to stop or reverse the progression of early prostate cancer, by extension, breast cancer, simply by making these changes. We found that tumor growth in vitro was inhibited 70% in the group that made these changes, whereas only 9% in the comparison group. These differences were highly significant. Even your sexual organs get more blood flow, so you increase sexual potency. Uh, one of the most effective anti-smoking ads was done by the Department of Health Services, showing that uh, <laughs> nicotine, which constricts your arteries, can cause a heart attack or a stroke, but it also causes impotence. Half of guys who smoke are impotent. How sexy is that? And we're also about to publish a study, the first study showing you can change gene expression in men with prostate cancer. 
This is what's called a heat map, and the different colors, and along the side on the right are different genes. And we found that over 500 genes were favorably ex uh, changed, in effect turning on the good genes, the disease-preventing genes, turning off the disease-promoting genes. And so these, these findings, I think, are really very powerful. They're giving many people new hope and new choices, and companies like uh, Navigenics and DNA Direct and 23andMe that are giving you your genetic profiles are getting some people a sense of, gosh, well, what can I do about it? Well, our genes are not our fate, and if we make these changes, they're a predisposition, but if we make bigger changes than we might have made otherwise, we can actually change how our genes are expressed. Thank you. Well, you, what he found was, literally, just in three months, all the genes that he could actually ex uh, do studies on to see if they were expressed or turned off, 500 genes were affected. He turned off over 400 negative ones, turned on 500 positive ones, that all uh, was good for you. And what I'm saying is, what did he say? Through that whole time, he goes, you can reverse you know, breast cancer, you can reverse prostate cancer, you can reverse heart disease, you can reverse aging, you can reverse, well, what was he saying you could reverse it with? Yep, 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 lifestyle. And what are we talking about in Maximize Living? We're talking about the five essentials, which is, guess what? Say it. Lifestyle. lifestyle. It's lifestyle. And so what is more important than genetics? It's how you're living today. And that's what I wanted to give you. That's why it's so important when you leave today, you leave with action steps, not with a rah-rah moment, but you leave with stuff that you can start doing when? Now, today, exactly. So... Um, Genetics. Let's just start with genetics, okay? So genetics are not holding the fate. Do you know that if I go and I hug Joel here in the front row, I'll give him a big hug, that I change his gene expression, okay? Uh, if he doesn't like hugs, I probably cause some negative genes. Uh, if, he, if he likes hugs, and I know he does, he's a good friend of mine, he literally would change genes for the good. Uh, do you guys know when you get adjusted, I hug you. I hug you because I'm a hugger, and I love you, and I like to hug. That's my thing. But guess what? When you go someplace else and you don't get the hugs, do you think it might be less powerful? And guess what research shows? It is, but watch this, it's not just hugs. It's when you walk onto a bus, if you got into a bus and you had a smile on your face, you change every single person statistically, research-wise, you change them for the rest of the day if they see a smile on your face. If you come in with a frown on your face and you're a bitter, angry person, you change them as well. And so the point is every decision you make, every thought that you have, everything that you do and everything that you say pulls a trigger and expresses a gene, which means if I go like this, I express a gene. If I go like this, I express a gene. If I work out, I express a gene. The food you ate express genes, which means your genes are nothing. Your genes are so low. Your genes are like the, the, the keys on a typewriter. And then you living pushes the key on the typewriter. You can, you can make whatever narrative you want. Now, some of you have different keys. That's the point. Some of you got, have genes that other ones don't have and what have you. But you're the one that hits the key on the, key, on the keystroke. Some of you guys don't know what a typewriter is for my young ones. That's this thing where it goes tink and it goes like this. If, if we could just say computer keyboard. The point is, genes aren't the fate. Does it make sense? Let me prove it to you. Watch this. Epigenetics. Everybody say epi. It means above. So it's what's called, it's what's above genetics. It means the expression of genes. And this, these two mice are exactly the same. They have the exact same, they're twin identical genetic species. They're cloned mice. And through their parents and their lifestyle, they actually expressed negative genes on the left and positive genes on the right. The one just through lifestyle is, guess what? He's sick, he's diabetic, he's overweight, there's cancer, he's got arthritis, and he lives half as long. The one on the right, guess what? Lean, brain is twice the volume, his brain is twice as big, healthy immune system, great joints, lives twice as long, probably gets all the mice girls. Got it? <laughs> Make sense? So the point I make is, guess what? Genes didn't cause this. So for you, guess what? Genes aren't it either. You know what makes me really upset is when I hear people go, yeah, my allergies are really bad. It just, it's just genetics. All my family has it. I'm like, no, it's not. And then someone says, yeah, I've got digestive issues. It's just genetic. Uh, no, it's not. It's probably the chili cheese fries you had last week. Uh, no, um, I've got headaches and it's genetic. No, it's not genetic. There's, uh, there is propensity, but guess what? You have to be hitting the keystrokes. Got it? And that's lifestyle. And that's up to you. That's the biggest thing I wanted you to get. And this is the study you just read. Now let's talk about stress a little bit. Stress is very, everybody say stress. stress. Raise your hand if you've not had any stress over the last week. Um, if I think I saw, maybe get that guy out of here. That's, uh, no, nobody here. Nobody raised their hand. There's a reason because everybody experiences stress because life happens. Got it? 
And, and in fact, if you don't have any stress in your life, then you're probably not growing anymore. Uh, and the t- only time that you're actually probably not going to have any stress is when God calls you home and you're no longer breathing here anyway. Does that make sense? And so the point is you're always going to have stress. But let me tell you what happens when you're under chronic stress. Two big things. Number one, everybody say G-A-T-A-1. G-A-T-A-1. Okay, remember we said play hard? Let's try it again. G-A-T-A-1. G-A-T-A-1. Good. G-A-T-A-1 is a gene transcriptase factor that turns on. Now, turning it on is not what you want. When you're under chronic stress, you turn it on. What happens is the nerve cell in your brain, the neuron on the left, is learning and it's growing out connections to other parts of the brain so that it has synaptic connections for memory and problem solving and learning and all the rest. Got it? That's what the one on the left looks like. The one on the right is a GATA1 turned on, and how many connections is that neuron making? Zero, nada, none, zippo, which means guess what happens to that person's brain if this continues? It's not growing, it's not maintaining itself, which means it's what? It's shrinking. Chronic stress causes your brain to shrink. Spectacular study, kind of scary. Another one, left is non-chronic stress, Right is chronic stress, GATA1 is transcriptase factor that's turned on. Did you get that? Who wants the left? Who wants right? Don't raise your hand. Okay, good. All right, so that's stress. But what about the other thing it causes? The other thing it causes is hormones over time in chronic stress actually cause neurons to die. Everybody say die. Yeah. You don't want your brain to die, so chronic stress is not what we want. We're going to talk about some uh, perspectives and some things you can do to, to combat stress here in just a second. But I want to also give you something else. Raise your hand if when you were growing up and you were taught about the brain, that you were taught that you're only born with so many brain cells and they may die as long as you go, but you have plenty, and then, uh, but you can't grow new brain cells. Anybody else? God, a lot of younger people than me. I literally was taught that you only have so many brain cells. So when we actually heard the word neo, neogenesis or neurogenesis, it means that you're growing new nerve cells. Your brain is always growing new neurons. Did you know that? new neurons every day, every second of every day, which means you can lose some and it's okay. The problem with it is, if you're under chronic stress, they actually die and continue to die, and then once they're dead, they actually affect the ones next to it and make them more likely to die. So the longer you're under chronic stress, the worse it can be for your brain, which is why you have to get a handle on it quick. Everybody with me? Now, what do you focus on, okay? Now, let me give you, let me give you some, some, uh, some examples. First of all, if everything was going right for a long time, your bank accounts you never had anxiety about, uh, your bills you never had to worry about getting them paid for a long time, nothing's broken in your house, everything seems to be going your way. If something happens, you can pretty much just kind of sail over it and keep walking, yes? But what happens when life happens and you're, you're a little anxious about money, you're a little anxious about your job because there may be reformulating some of the, the positions, uh, somebody was sick, you, you know, maybe it's a loved one or something, there's been a couple things that break. Some, you know there's a couple things that need to be replaced already, right? And so now something happens. Is there a difference in your perspective? What happens is the more things that, quote, are happening in your life that you, from your perspective, see as negative, the more likely that you are to focus on those things. But I want you to read this right here. Basically what this means is, and it's very reliable scientifically, 92% of the things that you worry about today are things that you don't have to worry about at all. Only 8% of the things you actually perseverate on mentally really are worthy of any worry at all. And then I'll just go back biblically. What's the Bible say about worry? It's not helping you at all anyway. You can't add one more thing to yourself by worrying. If you want to worry, instead of worry, take some action steps. Got it? Is everybody with me? So we want to stop the worry. And now what's the next question? Well, my thing at the house is still about to be broken. I have to replace that. My bank account is still a little shoddy, a little shaky. I'm not sure about my job and yada, yada, yada. What do I do about that perspective? Okay. Let's talk about Max Mind. Now you want to take some notes here. I'm going to give you some action steps. So be ready. I'm going to start with giving you a, an example. So my friend, uh, Alejandro Asuna, okay, he's from Puerto Rico. Everybody say Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, you guys just, I mean, what is it, about a month ago, what happened? Not just any hurricane, but a thousand year hurricane. Wiped out 170 mile an hour winds where his house was. Now he's a maximized living doctor. He has a very nice house. He's been in practice a very long time. He has a very nice practice, a very nice lifestyle. And when that storm hit, he lost everything but his children and his wife. Now when I say lost everything, I'm not talking about like he, he you know, got to keep a table or something. He lost everything, like his toothbrush is gone. The only thing he has left is his shoes on his feet and his clothes on his back. Now, 
do you think what he's worried about today is different than what you worry about today? Let me go a step further. Do you think the things that you're worried about that he would love any, for any second to be able to trade places with you right now? Guaranteed. And I hate to, to you know, the Bible says you're unwise to compare yourselves among yourselves, but at least for perspective's sake, it's not a bad idea to sometimes go, you know what, I got a lot better than 99% of the world. I'm doing okay. Got it? And most of the time, if you look back on your life, guess what you find out? It all works out anyway. You know, if you live, like, if you're in your 20s and 30s, you still worry as if, like, there's a cobra around your feet or something about to bite you. That's, I'm talking about myself. Sorry, a little transparent. But when you get to your 40s, you've already gone through a bunch of stuff, and it's like it's harder to get you off the center balance because you're like, oh, pfft, that's no big deal. God's got that. He's got that 10 times already. You see where I'm going? Right? So you have to have a perspective. But how do you start that? Everybody say gratitude. So this is your first action step with Max Mind. Wake up before you move your feet in a step-like pattern away from your bed, which means as soon as your feet touch the foundation underneath your bed or next to your bed, the first thing in your mind, or even better, before you even sit up on the side of your bed, start with trying to find at least 10 things you're extremely thankful for and grateful for. Now, I know that sounds rhetorical. I know it sounds too simple to be true. I know that uh, you're like, I, it's more sexy to talk about aluminum toxicity. Uh, but I can tell you that right now, I may have just given you the greatest asset before you go to brain health. Right there, what you just wrote down. Because when you start with gratitude, you change every neurochemical transmitter in your brain. And you can't have worry and thankfulness in your brain at the same time. And when you wake up and you're still in that type of brain pattern, which is uh, a lower brain pattern, you're not quite awake yet, and you start and you train yourself, guess what ends up happening to your, your programming? You start to become programmed for thankfulness. So I'm trying to change your program. I'm trying to rewrite your computer. So start every single day. If you could do that for 30 days, so right next to that note, write 30 days of reprogramming thankfulness. Got it? That's a big step. Next, get ready for your day. Don't get ready for work. There's a difference. If you get ready for work, get, what are you thinking about? You're thinking about your work. Get ready for your day. So whether it's Saturday, Sunday, Thursday that you're off, whatever, you get ready for your day. You don't get ready for work. If you get ready for your day, you're thinking about more than just what? Work. If you think about work, you're thinking about work. Now here's the thing. Plan your work. Be prepared. Plan what you're doing. Plan your lunch. Plan your meals. Plan when you're going to do things. Plan your workouts. Plan. But also, guess what? Don't just plan your work. Plan your what? Play. Plan your play. Plan what you're going to do when you get off work. Plan what you're going to do on your days off. Plan every six, eight weeks, maybe a half a day of going to do something fun, right? Joel and I are going to go do a little bit of hunting next week on my day off on Thursday. It's mental health for me, and I make sure those are in there. And I'm like a little kid at Christmas. I can't wait to go. If we could just cancel out Monday through Wednesday, we'd probably be good. Anyway, so mental health days. Got it? Okay. Next thing is don't take the same way to work every day. And I mean that metaphorically, and I mean that actually physically. Change your routine, because if you change your routine, you change the monotony. Monotony creates stagnation. You should probably write that down. Monotony creates stagnation. If you're doing something different, if you take a different route to work, maybe take the train one day down into Dallas at a train station. Make it, kind of change it up a little bit. Don't do the same things. Don't eat the same foods. Change it up. You got it? It helps change the brain. Do you get that? So next, okay, um, start to journal. Journal things down, okay, through what you feel, okay? Uh, and I would suggest to you, if you start journaling and it sounds like a uh, complaint session to God, this is what's wrong with my life, you're probably doing it wrong. Find thankfulness again, and actually as you go through this month, it'll change, okay? Journaling is big, okay? That's Max Mind. Here's three keys to help create positive attitude, okay? First one is, you are, it's so cliche, I'm going to say it anyway, you are literally the sum total of the five people you hang around most. You are, that's statistics, that's real, that's science. If, I, if you give me the five people you hang around, I can pretty much call it out, okay? I mean, literally. So you want to make sure that the ones you're hanging out the most aren't the ones that are negative. And I'm not saying cut people out of your life and be a, you know, a crazy person and you're, you're, you're off because you're too negative. No, we want to bring some people up too. The point is, though, if all you hang around is some, some negative Nancys, you're going to it's going to pull you down. And so make sure you're getting yourself around positive people. It's also why I tell my staff, you leave your problems outside the door. In fact, uh, you hardly will ever see a staff member of mine uh, having issues that are openly apparent. Because when you come to my office, the only thing I want you to feel is what? 
Joy, love, hope. Got it? That's why you want to get around people that have that. In fact, if you go to, to stores that don't have that, go to a different store. All right, live with gratitude. That's the 30-day gratitude. And laugh at ourselves. Everybody laugh. <laughs> ah, it's not good. That's not good. Laugh. Come on. Good. You know what's actually upsetting? I've told a couple of jokes, and none of them went over that good. That was, uh, that was pretty good, actually, the last one. Um, but listen, most of you don't laugh enough. You've got to figure out some things. And listen, don't, even if it's somewhat politically incorrect stuff, just find something to laugh at. I mean, in fact, laugh at yourself. I mean, uh, honestly, there's some crazy stuff that happens in my life. I mean, sometimes when you're adjusting people, they, they belch and they have gas come out this way. Sometimes you adjust them and the gas comes out the other way. Uh, but you just laugh, right? You just laugh. You just, you just have, life is, it's not a dress rehearsal. It's the only time you get it. And so enjoy the ride, right? Just look around, keep your head up a little bit and look, there's a lot of funny stuff. Uh, and I guarantee you this, if you spend enough time with God, you'll see he has one great sense of humor. <laughs> and so, I mean, just, it's good stuff. So laugh at yourself. Next one, start the day off with those three things. Again, with a plan, with gratitude, journaling, all the rest. Some of you guys don't read the word at all. Again, I'm in a church. I was a pastor. I have the legal right to say this, I guess. The point is, uh, if you're not reading the word of God, again, I, everybody's, there may be lots of different faiths and beliefs here, but I can tell you this, I'm not going to have an altar call right now, but if you don't know Jesus and you're not reading the word that has living, it's living and active, it literally is living and active. It, it reprograms your brain. It's just, it's, you know, it's a great, um, it's a great way to start. And if you're not doing that, thank you, Jesus. Uh, but the point is, if you're not in that word, you're missing something, okay? So uh, if, you, if anybody here has trouble really feeling the love of God, really feeling that, and I know sometimes we get into seasons where we feel like there's one set of footsteps and where did he go? Uh, if you ever have that, anybody here, whether you're a patient or you're not a patient, uh, that number that she put on the, on, the, on the deal, that's my personal cell, text me or call me and we'll have a sit down and I'll give you the greatest adjustment you ever had without even using my hands. Got it? Sound good? So just, there's that. Next. Sleep is also a max mind component, okay? Now, I'm not going to go through a lot of things, so just listen, but maybe take some notes. Um, how many hours do you need? Give me a guess. Eight. Everybody says eight. It's seven to eight, and it depends on the person. It depends on the season. It depends on your activity level, but it's seven to eight, and here's the thing. It should be regimented. You want the exact same amount of time every night if you can get it. You want to go to bed at the exact same time. The more that you can be regimented when you go to sleep and when you wake up, the better rim you're going to have. The better rim you have, the better you heal. The better you heal, the better your brain is, the longer your brain lasts. Got it? Now, when are the most important hours to sleep? Because some of you guys are night owls. I want my time. I'm going to stay up late. So you stay up till 11, you stay up till 12, and you get up a little bit later. Well, guess what? It doesn't work like that. The best hours are related to light. And so the best hours to sleep for the best rim are from between 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., which is why if you ever stay up late and you lose those first two hours of that, you're tired no matter what you can do. Got it? So 10 to 2 is the most important, although you want hours after that as well. So 7 to 8 hours. Uh, temperature in the room, 68 to 72. Sorry for those that like it warm, but 68 to 72 is the best. Uh, sometimes in Texas, that's kind of expensive, but that's the best. Also, you want it dark. Parents that want to have nightlights for their children, turn them off. It decreases IQ. It actually is hard on the brain. You don't want a nightlight. You want it black as you can get. People that are working shift jobs, uh, you want blackout windows for sure because your brain can't get to deep stages of REM, so you want deep, deep, deep. Got it? And there's all kind of things. Sleeping with your dog, sleeping with your cat decreases your likelihood of quality sleep by 62%. I could talk about kids. I'm not going to bring it up. It's political. But the point is there's things you could do to sleep better. Now, get this. I don't have time to do a sleep workshop today. If you would like an entire workshop just on sleep, if you're having issues or you think you can get better sleep, then go to... Um, YouTube, do Herb Family Wellness Sleep, uh, do a search for Herb Family Wellness Sleep. This workshop will come up, and it's a little less than an hour, and you'll learn all that you could ever possibly want to know. So about pillows, about bedding, about um, everything. Got it? Make sense? So Herb Family Wellness Sleep, and you'll get all of that. Hydration. Who knows that drinking a lot of water is important for your brain? Your brain is basically a fatty, liquid, electrical battery. And so if you take a battery, like your car battery, and through Texas summer heat, it starts to get a little less uh, fluid in it, what happens to the battery? It dies, it doesn't hold a charge. Your battery's the same way. It only takes 2% of dehydration to cut your cognition down 25%. This is not what you want for yourself. This is not what you want for your kids going out to school. So you wanna make sure you're drinking enough water. Next question is, how much water should I drink? 
Uh, it's different for everybody. I don't think there's an exact value, but here's where you start. Your body weight in pounds cut in half in ounces. So if I'm 200 pounds, that's how many ounces? 100 ounces. Got it? Pretty simple. That's where you want to start. Is that a lot of water? Maybe more you're drinking now, but it should probably cut out uh, the drinks of coffee and Cokes and whatever else. Okay, so it helps. Also, if everybody here writes down, drink more, drink that many ounces of water per day for one month, I will guarantee every single person in here, if you're not drinking enough water, your IQ will go up by 10 points. Do you get that? Drink more water. It also saves your brain. Next, brain teasers. This is very important. The average person only lives two and a half years after they retire. Do you know that? The reason for that is because your brain doesn't have something to go up against and problem solve and get over. So if you are retired, you better figure out something that your body is trying to push into and a purpose for living. The reason that these work for saving your brain is because it makes your brain work. It's like lifting weights, right? So they're brain teasers. You don't have to do crossword puzzles. You don't have to do brain teasers in Sudaku or whatever those things are. Um, I don't do those. But what my brain does nonstop is how do I save lives for people who have no idea, who are un- purposely ignorant of the truth in what health is. And my brain is nonstop. I wake up, I eat, I sleep, I go to the bathroom thinking about it. My brain is always problem solving. So I don't need to do crossword puzzles because I'm always doing it. In fact, ask my wife. I wake up in the middle of the night sometimes doing it. But your brain needs that too. If you don't have a great purpose that wakes you up every morning, then you ought to start adding in things that's going to keep your brain really great. And I would also say find the purpose. Makes sense. Another way you can do that is reading. Your brain reading, when you read, your brain sees pictures. So when you read, your brain is actually creating slideshows and movie pictures within itself. And just re- people who read actually maintain brain. Make sense? So reading often. The only problem with it is, in the United States, after, the eight, or after high school, most people only read one to two books the rest of their entire life. They will read one or two chapters of a book. Who here has read one or two chapters of a book and put it down in the last month? I don't have a camera at your house. That's just the statistic. Okay? Exercise. Okay, it actually produces new neurons, which we didn't even think was possible 40 years ago. Um, it absolutely staves off brain pathology and everything else. Okay, um, you could do it a lot of different ways, but might as well do it the most efficient way, which is Max T3. Uh, who knows that Max T3 is now digital? You can do it on your phone. So you go to maxt3.com. Uh, you can put in Dr. Kimberly and uh, Dr. Kimberly Herb is your doctor, and it will come up. Get your stuff and go. Make sense? Max T3 is 12 minutes, hardcore, off you go. What's the best time of the day to exercise? First morning, there's more hormone changes. When's the next best time? Any time of the day. Do you have to do something extremely strenuous? No. I had a lady one time, she, um, she was getting better and better, but she still, she was at a cubicle job, right? So she can't see anybody else. She's like in a hamster cage like this, and she's just in a cubicle. And it's quiet, like you can hear, a, like if someone dropped a pin, you could hear it kind of thing. So guess what, about two hours, two and a half hours, what is she doing? Like this. And most people in that office are doing what? Monsters, Red Bull, coffee, which is free, uh, actually soft drinks, which are free too, doing lots of caffeines, or they're doing lots of carbs to ch- chunk up their blood sugar, right, to stay awake, which is why everybody's diabetic and obese. But what she started to learn in her office, guess what she did? Every time she, every... Single time she got tired, guess what she did? She would literally push her chair out, walk this way, push the chair in, step outside of her cubicle, and then go like this. Like, people thought she was nuts. But every week, she'd come to the office, she goes, lost two more pounds. Another week, lost three pounds, lost two pounds, lost three pounds, lost two pounds, lost two pounds lost, only lost one pound, lost three pounds. And though 45 pounds later, guess what? Guess what everybody else thinks she is? Now guess what everybody started doing around the cubicles? They just pop up like eggs popping open, like little chicks. Just, you know, and then someone would be like this, right? How long do we, it was 20 seconds. 20 seconds of a surge will wake up your entire brain. So I would suggest to you to be the crazy person at your home, at your church, at your business this week, okay? Now, most single most important thing, too, it's amazing. Now, if you can't get exercise, now, I know some people here have some motion issues. Now, that's, that's also an issue. You know, sometimes we have some end-stage diseases, or we have some, I hate to say end-stage, but advanced diseases that keep people from exercising that they can actually work out like this, okay? So what do you do? 
Uh, or what if you, you need extra oxygen that you can't get? And there are, are some solutions. That's what the giveaway was a while ago. Uh, hyperbaric. Everybody say hyperbaric. hyperbaric. Hyper means a lot. Baric means chamber. Uh, so hyper means increased chamber, so increased oxygen chamber. What you're doing is you're pressurizing the air pressure, and you're flooding that air with high levels of O2. The reason that works is, and this is actually a history, this is, um, I forget what year this was, but uh, this was in a hospital, basically, that was all one hyperbaric chamber. So there's, inside that sphere is, is rooms, and you went in that little bitty uh, long hot dog looking chamber that's how you got in there and then they pressurized you and you walked in and they actually brought food in they had plumbing that was specialized for this and you stayed there and you worked out there you ate there you saw your doctor there and if you went in with a disease you didn't walk out until the disease was gone and and that it was faster than people thought and the reason it works is this is our unit that we actually purchased for our office who raise your hand if you've done hyperbaric at our office so we probably have 12 15 of you guys it works because it increases the pressure. Let me just talk about it. It increases the pressure, the barometric pressure. Okay, and what happens is Henry's law says that when you increase pressure, that gas will be uh, dissolved into fluid or into water. Okay, so what happens is if I increase the pressure on you, then oxygen, especially if I increase it in that, in that what you're breathing, it dissolves into every fluid in your body. So for oxygen to transport in your body, it has to go in the red blood cells. You see the red blood cells? That's how oxygen gets around your body. But when you're in a hyperbaric chamber, the plasma, the yellow plasma, it holds oxygen. The interstitial fluid that's red, it holds oxygen. So every single fluid in your whole body is flooded with oxygen when you're in a hyperbaric chamber. And so if you look at this, this is a brain, since we're talking about brain today, this is a brain before and after hyperbaric treatment in the unit that we have. What do you see there? It's a PET scan. What's happening to the brain on the right compared to the brain on the left? It's more active. You're seeing it wake up. You're seeing it healthy again. You're seeing the metabolism turn on again. Do you see that? So is it good for dementia and Alzheimer's and depression and anxiety and ADHD and those things for brain? Is it yes or no? Like no drug that has ever been researched on the face of planet Earth today. Now, if you're not going to do hyperbaric, guess what I want you to do every single day at some level? What does workout look like? That's not working out. Like, whatever your workout looks like, whatever you're doing, but this is what it looks like afterwards. Right there. Right there. Every morning, that's what my workout looks like. In fact, I ride bikes twice a week with Joel. He will confess to that for sure right there. We do sprints. So, but that's, that's oxygen. Okay. I'm a chiropractor. Get ready. This is the chiropractic component. But it's the nerve supply. Now this literally, more than any research pharmaceuticals, more than aluminum, more than sugars, more than anything else, nothing has been shown to be as effective at what we're talking about today is what I'm about to show you. And I'm not saying it because I'm the chiropractor, I'm saying it because I'm the research nerd who likes to read the research. Got it? Okay. Let's just start where we're somewhere. In fact, I love the matrix, so I love this picture. But Roger Sperry in 1982 won a Nobel Prize showing that your brain is an electrical battery. And what was amazing about what he said was, your spine produces the majority, not 52%, like 90 to 95% of the charge of your brain comes from just your spine alone. Not your knee, not your hip, not your upper arm, just your spine. So it's like a windmill that runs with wind that charges batteries. Your movement of your spine charges your brain. And he won a Nobel Prize. And what he said was, when you have postural distortions, so you got a high shoulder, you got a head forward posture, you got a belly that's out like this, or you got shoulders that are rolled like this, where you see kids a lot of times with big backpacks on like this, or now they're playing videos so much or they're on their Facebook like this. That postural distortion, he said, not me, he said that postural distortion decreases the charging of this battery, your brain, and the less charge you have, the less energy you have for thinking, uh, problem solving, immune function, digestion, organ function in general. Does that make sense? Do you see how majorly important this is? Okay, in fact, Joel, come here. You gotta jump on the stage. I didn't tell him I was gonna do this today. Come on, you got this. He's like, but wait, man. Now face the, face the screen that way. Now I'm gonna take Joel, we gotta go over here in front of the camera, so right there on that, right there. I'm gonna have a hard time standing there too. So 
So let's say that he carries a backpack today. So pretend you've got one strap over that one. Just put your hand up there. No, no. So what do you oh. do? You're going to keep it on your shoulder, right? So what do you do when you have your backpack on? You keep it on your shoulder. So raise that shoulder up, right? So do you see his shoulders high right there? What's that doing to his spine right here? Okay. Now, he, who carries your backpack on the same shoulder every single time if you carry one? Or purse or luggage. Yeah, <laughs> I got you. Now, he carries that like this, okay? So it's going to put a curve right here. It's going to put a curve where his neck's going like that. Do you see that? Just a little bit. Not so much you'd think he's a Quasimodo, but he's got a little bit of curve right there, right? Now, where, what organ in the body right in front of your neck right here uh, determines metabolism? Thyroid. So if somebody has a high shoulder, okay, a little bit of a high shoulder, a little bit of a head shift, maybe their earlobe is a little high on one side, and it puts a kink in their neck right here, do you think it might cause a thyroid issue? Sure it does. What if his shoulders were level, but he had an injury, he got hit from the side in a side impact car accident 12 years ago, and his ear is a little high on this side right here. If I take his skull, set it at an angle on top of his neck, so it just irritates the nurse while it chokes it off a little bit, not only does it keep it from charging the brain as a battery, but it also decreases the flow down as well. And the nerve supply going to the vascularity that supports the brain is now affected. It's very sensitive. So what could you have? Headaches. You with me? You see that, right? Now, let's do this. He sits all day at work. He doesn't necessarily, but if, let's say he sits all day at work. I know everybody here is sitting up perfectly straight, and you've got a curve in your low back like this. It's funny how many of you guys just sit up perfectly straight when I said that. But let's say he doesn't do that. Now, tuck your butt underneath you. So now he's got a rolled out low back like this. You see that? Now, if that happens, he doesn't have a curve in there, and it starts choking off the nerve supply in his low back. You can sit up straight now. I don't want to cause a problem. Uh, but now I choke that off. Now where does it go? Maybe male organs, maybe his colon. Maybe he gets to a certain age where his doctor goes, well, it's okay to have hemorrhoids or colon issues uh, because you're not 20 anymore. And so everybody blames it on what? On age. But there's guys that don't have that who also don't have the same problems. And so the only solution to his medical doctor for him having colon issues is we what? Do a drug, do some kind of constipation drug or an IBS drug. Uh, you know, we had a guy come in the other day with IBS. He was going to the bathroom 15 times a day. Guess where the problem was? Right there. But you don't go to the chiropractor for IBS. Or do you? Well, first of all, do we treat IBS? No. But if this is not healthy and I fix that and it just so happens that your body can fix the other, would that be a better solution? Great. Now go like this. Turn this way. Now, uh, pretend you have your phone in your hand. Now, where do you look at your phone? First of all, Everybody pick your phone up if you've got it, or your iPad device. Now, I want you to just, just like you just relax for a second. Now, um, don't open it, but act like you're going to look at Facebook or something. Good. Now, most of you guys will have it within one to two inches of your belly. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Now, hold your phone. Put it one to two inches from your belly. Right there. That's about 60 degrees of flexion. It puts um, 59 pounds of pressure on the cervical vertebra and your spinal cord. 59 pounds. You can go through this right here. This is all the symptoms this will create, but watch this. Do you see that? This is a very important slide for you guys to get. This is your action step. We're going to institute a new rule. Everybody say elbow. elbow. Elbow rule. Now put your elbows on your belly like this. Like this. Now keep your elbows there. Now put your phone in your hand and look at your phone. You are at least at a 15 degree or less. Everybody with me? So what did I just do? I cut over half the weight off of your neck just by doing that. Now, are your, are your shoulders and uh, arms gonna get tired like that? Yeah, that's why you hold it down next to your belly to begin with. But if your arms get tired holding it like this, guess what you should do? Get off your phone! <laughs> so, but watch, let's go back to the belly position again. Put that head down. Now. If I stretch out this spinal cord right here, and his brain is trying to tell his body what to do for digestion, and it's just a slight bit of dysfunction, so he can't quite absorb all the micronutrients it should need, could he experience fatigue, possibly, just from head forward posture? Has that been proven? And the answer is yes to that, if you didn't know. And so, head forward posture, rolled shoulders, lack of low back, high shoulder here, high ear. The problem with it is, when you're in grade school, by law, you and your children have to get checked for what, what condition? It starts with an S. Scoliosis. But once you get to adult, everybody's like, no, that's no big deal. And you go in once a year, and by law, you don't have to get your spine checked anymore. By law, you just get your blood pressure, you know, by law, you don't have to go in. But you get your blood pressure checked, your heart checked, they look in your ears, they do a blood test, they don't find anything, you're absolutely what? 
fine. But by the time that your blood pressure changes, by the time your blood changes to show a thyroid issue, by the time that your colon can be whatever looked at and find a growth inside of it, by the time any of these diseases come to fruition so that enough that they can be found, what is it? It's, you guys say too late, but it's not too late. A lot of times they find it and they can do something about it medically, right? They can chop something off, they can go do something. But the solutions are always what? Chop something out, do a procedure, or give you what? Give you a drug. Raise your hand if you'd like a lot more drugs the rest of your life. Good. All right. You're good. Thank you. Big hand for Joel. So what does that look like? Well, it looks like making some changes. Standing desks. If you, and listen, if you can't get a standing desk and you sit at a desk, guess what I want you to do? Take your wonderful phone that's ruining your life. It's not a joke. And then put a timer on it about every 15 to 20 minutes that it goes off and you have to turn the timer off while you're at work. Don't take a 15-minute break, but when that thing goes off every 15 to 20 minutes, stand up, stretch out, put some blood into your spine, and then sit back down. Could you do that? Yeah. Write it down. Next is a standing desk, right? So it's a transitional desk. It'll go up and down, okay? Sometimes those are on top of a desk. Sometimes it's the whole desk itself. But changing that helps. Also, if you're going to be standing at a desk or standing at work, you want to be able to put your foot on something. So you can take up some of those... Um, I don't even know why they give us yellow pages anymore. When's the last time anybody in this room looked at a yellow pages? No. So take the yellow pages that you got at your house that are in your closet next to the front door. Did I call it? Yeah. Tape them together with duct tape. Take it to work or wherever you're going to be standing. Put it next to your foot and put one foot on at a time and then switch over about every couple minutes. It takes 30% off the pressure off your low back discs. Got it? It needs to be about four to six inches. Okay? That's one way to do that. Okay, let's do a case study. Here's a kid that was sent to us by his pediatrician. Severe headaches, uh, fatigue. He also had ADHD. The headaches were not responding to medication. They even tried blood pressure meds on this kid, and you can tell he's not that old. What's wrong with his spine? Look at the top one. Look at the side view of him. What's wrong with that kid? <laughs> Look at him. Actually, one of the problems was backpack. He was wearing a heavy backpack. But guess what his hobby is? Guess what he likes to do a lot? Video games. games. So he plays video games, and he's in a couch, and he's doing this. Okay? Just like some of you guys on your phones. Now, doing this on a pediatric development of a spine, can you see how it would develop a really bad head forward posture? I think some of this was actually birth trauma, too, which is why we check every single child and every single adult. This kid gets checked, head forward posture. Now, the difference between our office and another one is, guess what? We don't just you know, pop or crack someone's spine, we're going to correct, we're going to fix the problem. Raise your hand if you're patient and you know that. Good, thank you. Now, after, guess what? This wasn't just a little bit of care. This was intense, exacting spinal rehab and exacting adjustments for specific for his absolute subluxation patterns. And this is about two months later. And just, I mean, he said he had idiopathic something or other. First of all, if any doctor gives you a diagnosis that starts with idiopathic, just get rid of the pathic, and that's what he is, or she is. Like, it's just, it's that you're an idiot if you give somebody an idiopathic diagnosis. Anyway, every cause has an effect, and every effect has a cause. This kid's head was forward, and you get it back, and guess what happened to his ADHD? Gone. Completely gone. His digestive issues are gone. His headaches are gone. He's doing great. Who here, if you had headaches, would like someone to actually find the cause of them and get rid of it? That's what we do. Okay, so now, next, what is a subluxation? Everybody say the word subluxation. subluxation. Now, let's do it again. Subluxation. Now, you do it on your own. One, two, three. Subluxation. Good. Perfect. If I say cancer, we do this every year. We do a cancer killer makeover. If I say cancer, I can get everybody in fear. I can get everybody in movement because you move by fear. Uh, that's what they train you to do for the society. And guess what? I say cancer, and you actually have an idea in your head about cancer right now, yes or no. I say subluxation, and you think neck pain or a crick or you know, a catch in my neck or something. But subluxation, that definition is perfect. It says a misalignment of the spine causing interference to the nerve supply with or without, with or without pain that creates dysfunction and disease. Now, the most important part about that is misalignment, so nothing, something's not right, and it's with or without symptoms, so you don't have to feel it. You don't have to feel the catch. You don't have to have the decreased range of motion. One of the worst subluxation patterns I've seen in the last three years came in just the other day, and the person has 100% perfect range of motion. Did you get that? And no pain. 
But this is subluxation. Now, I want to walk this out. I say subluxation, you go, yeah, it's a chiropractic thing. It's not a real deal. There's no, so there's no research. First of all, there's more research about subluxation and correcting that, creating a health, than there is about pharmaceuticals actually working, just so we're clear. The research is not scarce. If you'd like it, I've got it for you. But I want you to know that medical doctors know about this. Can I prove that to you? Is that okay? So I, I never get a chance to do this publicly and on Facebook Live. I want you to share this with every single person that you know. So this is actually out of a medical textbook, and it's, it, it, that word is kind of weird. It's pre -nosological. Everybody say pre -nosological. Three times. <laughs> Some of you are like, nope, I'm out. Uh, but pre diagnosis, it's basically the detection of borderline states between health and disease. Who would like to find disease the, the moment, the second that it started? So you never have to have it at all. That's what that means, pre -nosological. And this is actually a discussion in medicine right now because, again, medicine has no way really in, the, in the, the way that medicine functions to find anything until it's really, really bad. And so they know that, and they're wanting to do something different. So pre diagnosis. And this word, dysponesis. Everybody say dysponesis. This is from Dorland's Medical Dictionary. Again, medical school, medical taught. And I'm going I'm to walk this out for you. So it's a lot of complex stuff. Now watch this. What it says is uh, a reversible, which means what? You can fix it. Okay. Uh, reversible physiopathological. So it's just body physiology and it's got a pathological something going on function wise. So something's wrong with my physiology, okay? It's a state consisting of unnoticed, which means what? Didn't see it, didn't notice it, don't feel it, have no symptoms. Misdirected neurophysiological reactions. Now, what's a neurophysiological reaction? Neuro, it means what? Nerve. Nervous system, brain and nervous system. So it's a, it's a misdirected. So your brain, which should be in control of everything, is all of a sudden not in control of everything, and it's unnoticed. You didn't feel it. Um, um, reaction to various agents. What agents? Environmental agents, body sensations, emotions, and thoughts. And the repercussions of these reactions throughout the organism, which means what? Your brain can't tell your stomach to have the exact right pH for the steak, and now it thinks there's an apple in there, and because it can't digest the steak with the same pH that an apple does, you get indigestion, and you think you've got acid reflux, and your doctor diagnosed you with acid reflux, and you thought he was a brilliant diagnostician because he diagnosed you with acid reflux, and all you really had was a misdirected neurophysiological state which caused a chain reaction throughout the organism. Did you get that? Let's keep going. Um, these errors in energy expenditure, which energy is what? Electricity coming from the brain. These errors, these mistakes, these whatever you want to call them, which are capable of producing functional disorders, functional, are we talking about function, consist mainly of covert, which overt and covert. Covert is secret. We're spying. We're, it's, it's, not, it's under the radar. You can't, you can't know anything about it. I feel good. There's no sensations. Covert errors. Watch this. It gets crazy now. You ready? Turn up the heat. In action potential output, output means it's going from the brain down. Action potential means the nerve firing. These errors in nerves firing from the motor and premotor areas of the cortex, your brain, and the consequences of the consequences, the consequences of that output. For a lady who's 32 and they're about to do a hysterectomy and she's never had a child before. For the heart attack that's going to happen for the 42-year-old husband with three kids next week because he doesn't feel any pain, his blood pressure seemingly is, quote, just fine, and he does, because he doesn't have any symptoms, he can't tell the nerve splice choked off to his heart. The consequences of that mistake in output. Does that sound like subluxation to anybody in the room for the definition I just read a while ago? Yes. And that's taught in every single medical school. And yet, if you were anything like me, guess what we called chiropractors? It's like, it's like stereo, quack, 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 quack. Not real doctors. I mean, scarce anybody at research, right? And yet, this is what's taught in medical schools today, this very moment, which means, guess what? Raise your hand if you're my patient, if you're a patient in the room right now. Keep your hand up. That, that right there just means that you are literally doing the most cutting edge activity for your health known on the face of planet Earth. That's what that means. Yeah, that would be a good thing. Good. Now. Let me give it, let me one up it, because this rocked my world. How, what exactly happens when you actually have a nervous system that functions correctly? So they took somebody who was subluxated and they had them wiggle their left toe. Got it? Then they did a PET scan of their brain to see how much energy it took to actually wiggle their toe. 
And what you see there is those little fiery orange and red dots all over the brain. Those are electrical outputs coming from the brain to create this movement. And that's how much energy it took to do that movement. And then guess what they did? They analyzed the person's spine for subluxation, not for just lack of range of motion, not just where my neck hurts and adjust that, but for subluxation. And they adjusted the person's subluxation to remove interference, to increase the output, to decrease the neurophysiological misdirection state. And guess what? They increased the connection and the efficiency. Does that make sense? Now watch this. Then they adjusted them and had them do the same movement exactly, and they measured it, and then they did the PET scan again. This is the second one. What do you see? Your brain in one adjustment, not nine, not left and right, and left and right, and one, two, three down the middle, but in one adjustment is 50 times more efficient at doing the exact same work. Let me, let me, let me get it really, really easy for you. Watch this. Go outside, let me take your car and give you 500 miles per gallon. Do you think your car would last longer? First of all, who would like me to do that? <laughs> yeah, especially. But watch this. This is what we're talking about. So when people come in, they say chiropractic. Yeah, it's for neck pain, back pain, and headaches. Guess I want to go, uh, 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 throw up. Because it's like the last thing on the list of good is feeling good. If you never felt a second better for anything and you got adjusted so your brain did that, that is where the money shot is. Are you with me? Yeah. Right? So, is that cool? Yeah. That's new research, by the way. That, like, lit my fire, lit my Christmas tree. Now, one more case study, and I'm going I'm to bring somebody up here in just a second. But this case study, I don't have a post case study on this yet. This study here shows somebody, the one on the right, the x-ray on the right, is what you want to see. Good curve in the neck, not a lot of generation, no pressure on the nerve supply. The one on the left is a person, no pain, that just started. This is what they said. Hey, my, it just started. My arm just started. But they had a hard time keeping up. They couldn't keep their thoughts straight. They had a lot of brain fog. Can you see why? That's a choked off strangulated nerve supply, but no symptom ever starts from nowhere. They all have a starting point. Got it? Which is why every single person here needs to get what? Their spine checked and maintained for a lifetime. Come here, Julie. So Julie, um, give a round of applause for Julie, by the way. <laughs> Julie is awesome. I think that's, yeah, I think that's, that's right here. Julie uh, came to the office how long ago? Two months. Two months. Two months ago. Yes, thank you, Jesus, for bringing me a Julie. <laughs> we were looking for somebody, and then she walked in. Let's go over this way. I have to be on this little back dot. Thank you, John. So, uh, so tell us how it was before you came to the office. She's got, she's got her own testimony. So I've been in the chiropractic industry for over 10 years. I live it, breathe it. Um, my purpose is to get people better without drugs and surgery. I was in the best shape of my life for most of that time. Well, about three and a half years ago, I got diagnosed with a tumor on my spine growing down my sciatic nerve on my left side. So at my worst, I was in a wheelchair. My foot was completely dead. Couldn't feel it at all, and I couldn't put any pressure on it. And so um, fast forward to now. Uh, you, well, went, you went to chiropractors yeah, and doctors. Went to chiropractor. Chiropractors wouldn't touch me. Um, they thought I was a liability. Uh, medical doctor said I needed extensive back surgery, put a rod and screw in. Um, and anyway, that was against everything that I believe in. So I did nothing. And so my health spiraled downward. Fast forward to now, um, God kicked me in the butt and told me, don't let these gifts that I gave you go to waste anymore. Um, I found Herb Family Wellness and um, my purpose lined up with theirs. The first um, doctor's report that I went to, which was my interview, um, I actually, everything that Dr. Herb was saying um, was just confirmation of what I already knew, that the body has its, uh, the ability to heal itself. And so now I've been going through treatment for only two months, and I'm 60% better. Um, there's no way I could stand here and talk to you. Thank you. She also got married last Saturday, by the way. So. There's no way that I would be able to stand here without pain. And I'm standing here without pain. Go Randall. Um, I still walk a little funny, but that's okay because I fully expect to be fully recovered to 100% function. I've lost 22 pounds, over 20 inches, so I'm lighter on my feet. My foot is awake. I can feel it. I can feel it. It's awesome. I thought she was complaining one day. She was like, I can really feel my, can foot. Feel my foot. And the first thing I was like was, oh, I'm so sorry. She was like, no, I can feel my foot. I was like, yes, that's right. So, 
<laughs> and anyway, it's, it's so amazing. Would you say the care you've gotten at our office is different than the other chiropractic offices you've been a part of? Absolutely, yes. Good. Yeah. So, big round of applause for Julie. Thank you. Love you. I want to say one more thing. Oh, yes. I have to, I have to say one more thing. If, if you do nothing else today, if you're not already a patient, schedule you and your loved ones to get checked. It's, it, it's going to give you your life back. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Hey. Awesome. Yeah, you got that. Good. Got it. So. All right, good. Was this good for you guys? Yes. All right, let's okay, pray good. it up. If we'll you would, bow you your head. Out. So, Father, I just thank you for today. We thank you, Father, for giving us not just knowledge or revelation, uh, but things that we can walk out of here and start applying so that we have wisdom. And I thank you, Father, because you're the source of it. And I ask God that every word that was spoken was glorifying to you, that it was edifying to every single person that was here. It was life-changing for not just this group, but everyone that's associated with them. So I just ask blessings upon this church that allowed us to be here today. Yes. Every single person that helped put this day on, yes. everybody that sat in chairs, took notes, and learned. And Father, that every single one of us, that we'd be a group of people not just disjointed but unified in one purpose and that is serving in such a way God that glorifies you and it saves lives and it frees people mm. and so we just ask a blessing of peace and joy and rest over this weekend and change in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.